Hello? Uh, yes, hello. Hi, this is Victor Biganowski. Okay, I, I Ibrahim a, Gomez? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I have, yes, I have a building uh, that, that it is on the agenda today. Okay. Uh, I'm out here because uh, we had an emergency. I'm out here with my brother way out in the boondocks. <laughs> and my phone doesn't have a signal. Yeah, my phone doesn't have a signal, so I'm using his. Uh, how do I get for a, for a video? Well, we're trying to see if we... I tried to get on the city's website. Didn't work. I'm trying YouTube now to see if that works. But okay. I don't think it's a Zoom meeting. I, I don't think it's a Zoom meeting. But we're trying. Okay. I'll let you know if it's successful. Okay, great. I'm on. Uh, I'm under uh, the YouTube. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, website, and hopefully yeah. I can. You can get it going. We're trying. Uh huh. And I have these two rascals sitting next. To me. All right. <laughs> so you you have you're on the agenda also, sir. Yes, uh, it's for, uh, for, uh, let's see. Yeah. I have it right there on my phone. Mine is just a demolition. That's all I'm trying to get done. Is Ms. Prudencia right. on the line? Excuse me? Is Ms. Prudencia? It's Providencia. Providencia. Sorry, yes. ma'am. This is this is Ricardo from IT. I yes. I received a cancel notification on the meeting. Is no, that no. correct? No, no, it's not canceled. It's just that two people did not get the link for some reason. They deleted it, so I just sent it out again. It's not been canceled. Okay, just making Thank sure. Yeah, Teams just does that. It's already started on the live stream on the city website. If you guys can go ahead and uh, or you guys want to go through that, that's already started. Okay, FYI. I hate when I do this. And then she got over. I need my paper so I can click on. All right. Thank you. Come on in, guys, this way. Uh, let's see, city's website, PPP.
I don't see me on there. Yeah, it was on there before. Let's see. DJ, can you hear me? Can't read it. 
DK, are you there? If you want to mute yourself. No works, but I could do. Ah. <laughs> yeah, we can hear people. What's going on? Okay. Hey, DJ, can you hear us? Okay, don't see DJ. You should be a participant. Okay, well, pass me the phone. We're having some technical difficulties. Having some technical difficulties. Okay. No, good. We're good. Okay. 
Hey, Provi, can you hear me? I can hear you, DJ. Can you see everything? Okay, good, yes. Everything works fine. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry for this delay. This is the first yeah. time this happened, so I, I don't know. It happens. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, let's see. How are things looking? Do we have a quorum ready? We have a quorum. Okay, great. Well, in that case, let's get things started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry again for the delay. Um, it's currently 4.11 p.m. Um, and today is Monday, September 21st, 2020. Um, my name is DJ Savini, and I am the chair of the Historic Landmark Commission. Um, good afternoon, Proby. Good afternoon. All right. Um, before we dive into the different items, just I just want to give a quick summary for everybody who's calling in. Um, this is a big meeting today, so um, just keep that in mind because there are a lot of applicants and a good number of items that are on the agenda. So um, if we could just be timely with our discussions, that would be fantastic. Um, with that said, each item is basically presented in three phases. The first phase is Provi. Historic Preservation Officer provides a, a quick summary and a presentation of the property, the proposed undertaking, and um, answers any quick questions that she may be able to answer. The second phase is um, allowing the property owner or property representative to answer questions um, directly. And then the third phase is voting, uh, the Historic Landmark Commission voting on the, um, the item itself. So um, that's basically it. And um, before wasting any more time, just want to give this over to Provi so then we can get going. Um, before we start, are there any uh, changes to the agenda or public comment? Yes, um, there is, has been a change. Item number two has been postponed. Okay. So we won't be hearing that. Okay. And I also want to let you know that we have a new commissioner. Uh, we have Eddie Castle, who's an engineer with M&K Architects. So I'd like you to welcome Eddie to his first HLC meeting. All right. Well, congratulations. Welcome to the HLC. Thank you, everybody. We hope we don't scare you off, Eddie. <laughs> no. No. Well, you know what? Item two almost spooked me. That was all okay, the paper Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> when I was a kid. That's going to be a hot one. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Well, good thing it's on your first meeting. Yeah. We need to lose you after one. Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. So. All right. Great. Well, it's great to have you. And um, process, don't be afraid to ask. You know, uh, this is a learning process. So we're happy to answer any questions. All right. So um, after that, should we dive into item number one? Okay, item number one. Let me see. Oh, go ahead. Please take care of that. Sorry, give us a second here. Sure. Okay. Can you all see this? Yes, I can see it. Okay. All right then. Okay. Okay. So we'll start with a statement again. Uh, we're just going to make this a product of every meeting that we um, have. So the statement from the Historic Preservation Office is: This is a reminder that this is an official meeting of the City of El Paso's Historic Landmark Commission. We ask and expect that all attendees are courteous and respectful to each other to ensure a professional meeting. Any excessive display of uncivil behavior or being disruptive may require for an individual to be removed from the meeting. So that's our advance notice. Then from chapter 20.20.080, certificates of appropriateness, certificates of demolition, and applications for administrative review shall be granted, granted with modifications, or denied based on the following criteria. When City Council has adopted architectural and design guidelines for a particular district, those guidelines shall control, provided they are not in conflict with other requirements of the City Code. 
except that the HLC may approve exceptions to the guidelines in an effort to maintain the historic integrity of an H overlay property, in which case the exception shall control in that particular case. And what that means is that when it comes to a particular item, the Historic Landmark Commission has the right to approve it if it doesn't fall within the guidelines, but that only is good for that item. That doesn't mean that if your item is not approved, that your neighbors will be approved and vice versa. So I hope that's clear. Yes, thank you, Proby. Sure. Okay, item number one is a certificate of appropriateness for 4801 Graham Court. This is located in the Austin Terrace Historic District. It's zoned R4H, which is residential historic. It was constructed in 1952 and it's non-contributing. The certificate of appropriateness is for window removal and replacement and construction of a parking pad in the front yard after the fact. Um, this item has been on our agenda for a few weeks now. Um, for some reason, the owner was not able to call in the first time, so I hope he's here today. And the way this came about is that the owner had asked for uh, approval for an HVAC unit on the roof. As part of the application process, we asked that the property owner fill out an application, send photographs of the house, send photographs of the location of the existing unit, and cut sheets of the new unit with specifications such as dimensions and things like that. So this is what the property looked like when it was surveyed, which was about the year 2000 or so, 2002. And let's take a look, this is what it looked like. Um, you can see that some changes have been made. The windows have been removed and replaced without any permits or approvals. And then we have the parking pad in front, okay? Um, something that's kind of unusual in historic districts and certainly not encouraged citywide. So, when we spoke to the owner, he said that, yes, the windows had been removed and replaced in 2007. I guess it was overlooked that no permit had been pulled. Um, and the parking pad, I don't remember getting a date for that. But when we looked at the surrounding area, we realized that this kind of configuration is a little unusual. So you can see there is no parking pad here in the front yard. There isn't one here either. And like I said, it's a slightly different configuration. Now, we do get some applications like these every so often where someone wants to do something, we ask for a photograph, and we see that there are some violations that have never been reported. So in an effort to make sure that there is conformance, um, especially with the guidelines and with the process, we ask that the property owner take care of these violations before we go ahead and issue a permit for any new work. So that's what we ask the property owner to do. So what we're going to re recommend is approval for the modification based on the following. The design guidelines for El Paso's historic district sites and properties recommend that when repair is not feasible, door and window products will be reviewed on an individual basis using the following criteria. A, architectural and historical compatibility. B, comparison to original profile. C, level of significance of original doors and windows to the architectural style of the building. And D, three-dimensional exterior applied muntins that simulate or match the original muntins may be approved. Single dimension interior applied muntins are not appropriate. Place non-traditional site features such as swimming pools, playground equipment, concrete pads, and basketball goals, tree houses, dumpsters, and trash receptacles only in areas such as rear yards where they're not visible from the street. Most of the older structures in El Paso have parking provided at the rear of the property in a garage or carport structure, and every effort should be taken to maintain the use of the original parking areas. Where additional parking is necessary, it should be located to the rear of the property as well. It is against the city ordinance to park in the parkway Proposals for secondary driveways shall be reviewed and considered by the Historic Landmark Commission for approval. The Administrative Review Design Guidelines recommend the following. Parking is prohibited on parkways and is not recommended on front lawns. The Secretary of the Interior's Standards for Rehabilitation recommends that the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. Distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a property shall be preserved. Deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. Where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature, the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities and where possible materials. And replacement of missing features shall be substantiated by documentary, physical, and pictorial evidence. And actually, there are two modifications. Modifications that the concrete pad be removed and that no permits be issued for the property until it is in compliance. Okay, thank you, Provi. Um, I do have one question. Yes. While you were on site, what's the parking situation like on the street? 
Do you, do you see ample parking or is it pretty tight? Let me take a quick look here, DJ. Give me one second. It looks like parking is allowed on the street, as far as I can tell. Um, I'm looking at it from Google Earth right now, and there are cars parked a little farther up the street, but it is the same street. So it seems to me that the parking is available in the neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody else have questions for Pogi? Yeah, I had, is the owner using any part of the backyard for parking recommended by the um, guidelines? It looks like there's a large structure in the rear yard, Vicki, that I imagine is used for parking. And it seems to me, if you look at this photograph, I don't know if this one. It's Sunday. Okay. Okay. It's not sharing anymore. Right. It's not. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry about this. Is that it? Yeah. They, okay. They don't have access to the rear of that property. Well, there is an alleyway in the back that's pretty substantial. There is a structure in the rear yard. Okay. Can they see this? Yes. Okay. And we were looking at this when we went out there to take a look at it about a month ago. And it looks like there might have been an attached garage at one point because look at that very wide driveway that leads up to what is now room in the house. So I suspect that that was a garage at some point that's just been closed up and turned into living space. But you do have a driveway there. I'm not seeing the need for this parking pad, this concrete pad in the front yard. Yeah, I certainly agree with you. Um, it seems like this house could have had a a carport or something that was later enclosed, mm -hmm. which explains the concrete driveway leading right up to the house towards the left. Does anybody else have questions for Provi? Okay, um, if not, is the building owner or Building representative here. Mr. Gomez, are you present? Mr. Gomez? Give me a second, DJ. I'm going to look for his number. Okay. I don't seem present. Uh, DJ, I don't know that if he's, I don't know that he's available. I don't see his number listed. Uh, we did send him an email. We did speak to him to let him know that the meeting would be rescheduled for today. No, it's fine. Okay. And the expiration this for this was. Um, yeah, it looks like it's going to be 924. So you need to make a decision today. Right. Right. But no, I don't see the owner present at the moment. Okay. Got it. And then uh, just so that everybody is aware, if we denied this application, the owner has one year before they can reapply for it, correct? Correct. Okay. 
All right, so that's an important component to, to keep in mind. Yeah, I mean, since the the homeowner is in here. Um, well, yeah. Do you want to postpone this to the end of the meeting and maybe at some point we can take a break and give them a call? Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. Let's mm -hmm. do that. Because Let's we do that. Them. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, then. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll put this one on hold and then move on to item number three. Okay, then. Okay, so shall we go on to item number three? Uh, yes. Okay, do we need to make a motion to table this at the end of the meeting or what? Yeah, Ross, can you uh, provide some input, please? Yeah, I can go ahead and make a motion. Somebody make a motion to table it until the end of the meeting. All right, great, thank you. I thank you. Go ahead, Vicki. I either move or second whichever you need. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, feel free to make the motion, and then I guess okay. I can. Do it. I so move that we delay this, and I would recommend that we try emailing him to tell him we're trying to get a hold of him. Yes, I I second that. That's the way we were successful in communicating with him before. Okay, so we have a seconded motion on the table. Um, all those in favor? Uh, Hello. Listen, Hello, this is Victor Biganowski. We're here for item number three. We yes, haven't we gotten to one. item number three yet, sir. Give us a moment. Oh, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so let's go for a vote to table item number one until the end of the meeting. Um, we'll go individually uh, down the line. Uh, this is DJ and I vote yay. I have an I vote yay. Vicky, I vote. Mark, I vote yay. Chris, yay. Shane, I vote yay. Eddie, yay. Okay, great. Um, is Mr. Macias here? Is he present for this meeting? I don't think so. Okay. Well, in that case, let's move on to item number three. Okay. Item number three it is. Item number three is a certificate of demolition for demolition of a two-story building uh, located at 812 McGoffin Avenue, located in the McGoffin Historic District, zone C48, which is commercial historic, constructed in 1920, and it's a contributing building. So the property is located at the edge of the district. And this is what the property looked like when the survey was taken in about the year 2000, so about 20 years ago. As you can see, it was very intact. Uh, there have been some alterations made to the main facade and the second floor was enclosed. Uh, very recently, there had been a fire uh, at the building. This is what it looks like now. And we have some detailed photographs for you. So the entire building has been boarded up. Okay. There is a fence along the main facade on the front property line so that no one has access to it. But you can still see some details of the old building on there. Okay. And these are some pictures from the interior. So the building has been boarded up. So when I spoke to the contractor about this certificate of demolition, I explained a few things that I'm going to um, explain to you guys, which is that I've been here 10 years, and in 10 years, the HLC has approved demolition two times, and I'm gonna tell you what those are. This was in 2016. It was demolition for deteriorating addition on the rear facade in Austin Terrace. And it was basically this portion of the building. So as you can see, this was constructed of CMU, it's a little haphazard. We're not sure that it was structurally sound, 
But the property owner had inherited the property from a deceased relative and wanted to get rid of this. Since it was in the back, it was in addition. Um, it was really not terribly visible and it didn't have really any great his original historic fabric. The HLC approved the demolition of this section. So the entire house is still there, but not this addition. Then in 2018, the HLC approved demolition um, down on Alameda Avenue for Sun Metro for their mission trail um, or their mission, what is it called? Sun Metro. Sun Metro, yes. Basically, it was these buildings were demolished and plans for new construction were also approved. And this was to make the terminal, the bus terminal down there, a little more user friendly um, and just in order for it to better suit the needs of Sun Metro. So the HLC approved that. Now, what I also want to point out is that this district, the McGoffin Historic District, is also on the National Register of Historic Places. And if you look down, this is page 18 of the nomination and number 99812 McGoffin, there's a description and the status is C, which means it's a contributing property. Now, properties are on the National Register and are contributing and are commercial are eligible for tax credits. The state of Texas has a 25% uh, tax credit that's equal to about 25% of the cost of rehabilitation that can be combined with the federal credit, which is 20%. So you're looking at 45%. And many buildings have used this tax credit to their advantage. Excuse me. We know that the Hotel Paso del Norte has, has used it. The Martin Building has used it. The Bassett Tower has used it. Um, and we believe that the Blue Flame Building was designated in order to take advantage of the credits. So this is something that's available to the property owner as an alternative to demolition. Then I want you to look at some other properties that have considered demolition but have not gone through with it. This is 1003 Olive, which is down the block from this structure. So in about 2000, this is what the house looked like. It was a very classic Victorian era style house. And about 2015, 2016 or so, there was a fire. This picture was taken about last week. The structure is still standing. It has also suffered a fire, but has not been demolished. It's still intact. Okay, so this is the property in Socorro, okay, um, where Sun Metro had asked that you permit demolition and this was approved. As I said, we approved demolition and then we approved new construction. And then there's this property. I'm sorry, no, this is Socorro, excuse me, I'm sorry. This is Socorro Avenue. This property is in the Isleta Historic District and this was also pro um, proposed for demolition at one point, and this was approved, not approved, sorry, this was proposed by the Department of Community Development because they were helping the property owner by supplying him some funding to rehabilitate the property. So this is what it looked like before the fire, this is what it looked like afterwards. The property was never demolished, as you can see here. If anything, it was rehabilitated very successfully. So when we looked around the area, we can see that the houses are very unique in McGoffin, and they're still pretty intact. So we're recommending denial of this application based on the following. The McGoffin Historic District Design Guidelines recommend that once a property is demolished, it is gone forever and can never be replaced. The demolition of any structure is a dangerous alteration causing permanent change and damage to the character of an area. Plans to demolish a structure in part or in whole should be avoided until attempts have been made to work with the existing structure or before approval has been granted by the Historic Landmark Commission. The Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation recommend that the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize the property shall be avoided. Distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize the property shall be preserved. And deter deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. Where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature, the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities and where possible materials. The placement of missing features shall be substantiated by documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. So demolition is always the absolutely last resort when you're talking about a historic district because demolition is basically death. It's permanent. There's no coming back from it. And for people who say, well, you know, I can construct something very similar on the site, the answer is no, you probably can't because codes are now very different and construction techniques are also very different and a lot of materials are just not available. So in this case, after we did our little research and we walked, walked around, we realized that demolition really is not the answer in this case. This is still a viable property. Um, yeah, we think that it can be restored and we think that with the tax credits that are available to the property owner, the cost can certainly be offset by quite a bit. 
So we're asking you to deny this demolition. Okay, thank you, Provi. Um, yeah, these are some pretty striking pictures you presented us, especially the interior shots. Um, while you were on, now, are those photos that you have taken recently? Um, yes, and okay. the property owner did supply us with the interior shots. We could uh, not go inside. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. But you were able to look at the exterior, clearly. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so I know there's visible, especially with this picture, the one with the, the columns looking up, um, I mean, there's clearly visual, uh, you know, noticeable fire damage here. How does the brick look, you know? I mean, is that noticeably damaged on the, the facade of the building? Well, this is one picture of the brick. Right. Okay. And here's another. I think the exterior of the brick has held up very, very well. Yeah. And yes, it could probably use some cleaning, but... It's still there. It's still acting like brick. Um, as you can see, it was sort of covered over at one time, right? Because here it was. It was yeah. stuccoed over. And now yeah. a lot of that stucco is gone, and they may have protected the brick somewhat. It may have acted as a sacrificial material. Yeah, I agree. That's not our building. It's not, that's not it. That is not our building. Excuse me? A12 McGoffin? On the slides, it's not our building. The sides we're looking at, it's a one-story building. That's not our building. Um, first of all, who are you? My name is Victor Biganowski. I okay, own Mr. The Biganowski, property. can you hold on a moment while we settle this? Because I don't think you're seeing what we're seeing. We're seeing a two-story structure. Not me. Okay, you probably don't have access, Mr. Biganowski, but it's a two-story structure at 812 McGoffin that caught fire. And these pictures were also sent by your contractor. Well, so the, the, uh, the, give us just a moment while we not. finish. Give us just a moment while we finish the discussion, then we'll call on you. No problem. But okay. if, if you're going to represent a building that's online that we're looking at, it's the wrong building. Um, we have two-story buildings that's here. I don't think you have access seen. to it. Well, this is an open meeting on YouTube. I think I should be able to at least look at the building that you're saying. That's it. That's, it. That's, the, That's building the building right there. That's the building That's we've been talking about. Okay, so let's let staff finish the discussion with the commissioners, and then we'll call on you. No problem. Okay. So, DJ, you were saying? No, I was just saying I, I agree that um, any stucco that was applied to the exterior was a sacrificial coating during this fire. So, um, interesting stuff. Does anybody else have questions for Provi with this item? Uh, yeah, Provi, the evaluation for the rest was the second story enclosed. Uh, Vicki, I'm sorry, that came out pretty choppy. Can you lean a little closer to your microphone? Okay, let me try again. Hear me now? Yes. In uh, the nomination, is the the second story front porch at uh, a part of? Vicky, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. You're coming in very choppy. It sort of goes in and out. Okay, I don't know what to do other call. Mm -hmm. uh, that's okay. What, uh, I, I believe what she's asking is. If the second story addition was original to the property, or if that came later, I believe that came later. Is it historic? Well, we had the record of construction being 1920. I suspect it might have been a little earlier, actually. 1920 may reflect the additions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, I mean, just at first glance, it looks like the bracketed porch um, is the it used to just be a, a roof without the second story and then at some point later it was extend, extended out and enclosed yeah. while the first floor mm -hmm. porch remained okay um, any other questions for Proe?
All right. Um, is the building owner available for discussion? Yeah. Yeah, I am. It's Victor Biganowski, but I'll let my contractor, who went through the entire building, the outside, uh, the basement, the exterior, and the interior, uh, talk. Hi, good evening, Commissioner. How's it going? Your name, please. You Introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm calling on behalf of Chris. Sorry? My name is Anthony. Okay. Okay, doing a review through the building, there was a, a lot more pictures that were provided over. The columns that you have represented on this picture are very brittle at the point of time that if someone would even tap into them, they might fall. They're scorched. We went around the whole property. The foundation is pierced in multiple locations as well. The, fall, the building all around in this entirety is falling apart. The inside, there really isn't a second floor. We didn't provide pictures of the second floor due to the concern of our well-being. So we don't have any access whatsoever. All the stairs are deteriorating. The burn smell inside is ferocious. There's really no way around getting that smell out. And you're talking about a new building that wants to go up there with all the same historical traits and all the guidelines that you guys have for us. All our concern is, to be honest with you as a contractor, is the well-being and the security of our clients and their customers for future to come. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for the assessment. Um, I have a quick question. Sorry to interject, but um, has a structural engineer assessed this building after the fire? Yes. And that's what was determined if um, we also have provided the fire reports analyzing their input and their intake into what the building structure is at this point in time. All right, so has the report from the structural, assess, uh, structural engineer been shared with the Historic Preservation Office for the city? No, we got the fire report and I passed the fire report onto a fire plans inspector who said the fire report basically says there was a fire. Um, okay. It does but not really take much of a. Excuse me. Compile one for you, if you like, and send it over. That shouldn't be an issue, due to the fact you know with everything of uh, the pictures and every structural stability of the building itself. You know, he's going to agree with us 100 percent. Well, I know you're concerned about the finishes and interior and everything, and I really do appreciate the amount of effort you know you you made to point those out but i mean we're sort of putting the cart before the horse i mean we're we're just looking at this right now you know i mean it's been 10 minutes 15 minutes since we've seen this item and um there's a lot going on here you know i mean even the item that was shared with us for to prepare for this meeting on thursday did not make any indication there was a fire on this property so um yeah, there, there's certainly a lot of questions here. I'm sorry? Yeah, this is Victor Biganowski. Uh, I own the building. May I say something, please? Yes, you've made it very clear that you own the building. Yes, go ahead. Right. Um, number one, uh, we provided the fire reports months ago. The, this, I bought this building about four or five months ago and started this process respectfully. And I'd like to thank all the committee members for their time today. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. There's actually been two fires in this building. Uh, the first fire was, I'm sure, caused by homeless people for whatever reason. And it burned the structure horribly. Uh, I'm an attorney here in town. The smell is so toxic. There's no way you're ever going to get the smell out of it. The, we provided interior pictures. I've only seen one or two, but we provided several. Uh, and we provided pictures of the, the destruction of the foundation. Now, uh, and we provided other information and other pictures. The, the second fire that was started actually resulted in the accosting of a fireman by people who were in there, I guess, using it uh, during the winter months to keep themselves warm. Nobody wants to tear down a building that's not necessary, but I would like to invite you people or anyone 
I don't think the lady that was speaking, unless I was wrong, uh, she was able to even go near the building because the fence around it. We did that because I just recently purchased the building and vagrants and homeless people continue to go in there and create a problem. Uh, they're vandalizing the place. There's garbage everywhere. We even saw rodents and rats in there. I, I don't believe, based on the destruction, the total destruction of the building, I even went there a week ago before this meeting to look at it myself. I couldn't walk upstairs because it was totally destroyed. I don't see how this building can be rehabilitated. But if you want a structural engineer's report, I had someone look at it. If you would just table your meeting, if that's what's going to, if that's what you're going to base your opinion on, I'll get you that opinion. There's no way I can rebuild this building or rehabilitate it. There's just no way. After the second fire, that was made perfectly clear, records which we provided several months ago. And I bet you we provided 20, 30, 40 pictures of the damage to the building and the basement, whatever that means. We have tried to come up with ourselves with a plan with our contractor to rebuild or rehabilitate this building. Even with the tax credits, it's not possible. The toxic smell, the toxicity of the building due to the fires, even though you can cover that with aluminum paint or other materials, there's no way you're going to get that out of there. The interior of the building is gutted and filled with garbage. I would be glad to show it to you. I mean, I'm sorry we're here to try and raise this building. I, I don't want to do that. But I bought it the way it was because the people that sold it, for whatever reason, they couldn't rehabilitate it either. So I bought it. I'm trying to do the right thing. Uh, we've come to you. We've been patient. I understand COVID. There's limits on what anybody can do. But I would ask you, if a structural engineer's report uh, is something that you would need and you don't have it, I had someone look at it just table the meeting until the next time. I don't think it's going to be an imposition. I think it's just due process. I know you want to be fair to me as I want to to you. I will get that to you. And then if you want to make your decision based on that, that would be fine. That's all I ask you. I think we've presented enough evidence, especially with my contractor's testimony, to justify the demolition of the building. And let me tell you something. The brick is destroyed. We would have to replace almost all the brick on the outside and whatever brick is on the inside. That's an impossible task in regards to rehabilitation. It's not an impossible task to rebuilding the building, which we would have to come back to you with the plans so that you could see that we were keeping the integrity of the area. Now let me tell you something that's very close to our building. As a matter of fact, 100 feet away, there's a steel structure. There are new apartment buildings. There's a contemporary design for the policeman's pension plan building less than a block away. There's the new federal court building. We're not going to do anything that, that uh, extensive or different. We'd like to keep it the character of the neighborhood. I would think you would want me to do that, and my wife. That's well, what I mean, we did. It with we're all gonna, due respect. I mean, I'll, gonna, I'll speak. If, if I'll speak you, for myself. Yeah, I understand. Okay. That. Yeah, and yeah, um, go ahead. I, I really appreciate the, you know, the efforts you've already put into this, and I apologize that it's taken so long for you to be here at this uh, at this meeting. Um, sure. You know, it would be great if you could provide the structural uh, engineers report. I will do and, that. Also, um, when you refer to rehabilitation, um, what do you mean by that? You know, like what, what well, what's your definition of there's rehabilitation? No way to, there's no way to rebuild this building with the structure the way it is now. The brick is gone on the inside and outside. You want to come in the inside, I'll be glad to walk you through it. I, I could only stay it, I could only handle it for 30 seconds. The destruction is total. I mean, it's not something I want to do. I would rather, you know, I'm, I want to rebuild it for my law office. 
that's why I did it, because I like downtown. I ran a block away. And I, we looked for a building, my wife and I, and family. We have a family law firm. My son, Joshua, is a lawyer. He's in with me. My other son is an office manager. It's a family affair. My wife works here, too. We want to add to the city. So we looked for a structure, and we found this. It took us a while to purchase it, and we did it initially hoping we could rebuild the structure the way it stands. But I've had people look at it, and everybody's told me the same thing. It, it doesn't make sense. It, it's impossible. The structure's gone. We will show you how much of the structure is actually cracking all the way up the side of the building. It's not safe. That's why I put a fence around it so nobody get hurt. And to keep the, the homeless and the vagrants out of there so there wouldn't be any fire. But they have broken in there several times. And we, we found them living. We had to get them out of there. They, they put all kinds of stuff. They've ripped out things from the building probably to resell it, whatever was in there. I mean, we, we've tried. We, we've tried to do the right thing. But yeah. if you want a structural engineer's report, I'll get it. If you will just table the meeting for the next time, then I'll present it to you and I'll wait. I All right. Will wait. Thank you. I mean, if anything, I mean, I'm speaking for myself here. Um, I mean, I would just like to have a conversation so then we can see what the future is of this property, whether the building is sure. going to be, you know, gutted and, and rebuilt or just completely demolished and rebuilt because you're right i mean just looking at these pictures yeah the interior is compromised it's just you know that's i, I don't have to be an engineer to see that you know and um yeah just just so then us as a commission can have a better understanding of what your vision is you know and what work you've done so far because if you've done For cost sure. estimates if you've looked into different options to see all of those efforts come into effect when we make this vote because then it shows us that you already put the the thought into this you've already looked for cost estimates to see how much it would cost to rehab this building with the tax credits as opposed to completely demolish it and rebuild it um you know just looking i'm looking for options you know i'm looking to see what options you've done so far and that's just me i mean there are you know I'm one of numerous commissioners here, and I know I'm already taking up a lot of the time here, so um, I don't want to do that. So please, if anybody else has comments to say um, or questions or anything, please go right ahead because um, I've already taken up too much time. So thank you. This is uh, Eddie Castle. So um, I, I do have a couple questions for Anthony, the contractor, and, and for uh, the owner. Um, there are some broad, state, broad sweeping statements made as, for, you know, language like destroyed, gone. Um, but for the contractor, do you have experience with brick restoration and with projects such as these in the past? Yeah. And, and um, maybe not so much in this moment for everybody's benefit, but perhaps you could put a um, some type of resume or experience record together for the uh, for the commission and committee members so that we can we can review, you know, exactly how you've approached projects similar to this one in age, complexity, condition. Um, I know that uh, you know fires are particularly damaging and. and those are those are fair statements, and uh, the photographs that you've submitted thus far certainly document the extent that the fire has, you know, wow. damaged the wood and interior materials within the building. But um, I think that me speaking just for myself, like DJ said, I I would like to see that the engineer really pursue a you know a, a strong condition assessment of the masonry, and for you guys to demonstrate you know some type of plan of how you would you know. How you've tried to to salvage or restore, or you've priced or vetted any efforts towards restoring any of the uh, exterior brick. Um, Eddie, thank you for that. That's very good input, and I think that's um, something we should definitely see at the next meeting. So thank you for the input, Eddie. I think that would help clarify a lot of things. I I, I would like to point out that 
um, that in the previous case where demolition was concurred with, in order it, with with new construction considered, we could see what was being considered in detail. And now it's just broad brush. Or we don't, and there's not been any commitment to time or uh, any other thing for a replacement structure. I don't. I I, I agree with Eddie that. Um, the broad brush statements of the, the brick being destroyed, I dealt with fire damage buildings and sometimes, yes, but it's not the brick that would be destroyed. Um, and so I, I'd like to see and hear more of that. What... And and if those are load burning brick walls, I'd like to know that too, what the structure of the wall is. Not the interior partition, the walls. I think it's uh, always better if it could be a little bit more hands-on. If there was any way we could probably organize something where we can meet on site and we can walk you through it. I don't know if that's permitted. Rusty, is that permitted? I don't. Because if they meet on site, we have the danger of having a quorum. Yeah, I mean, that's the issue. Is it would be a meeting. And the public would have to have access and and things like that. Also, kind of the COVID issue, yeah. having a group together. Good. Well, we'll start working on our end so we can give you those structural reports mm -hmm. in detail and point out every single thing that's wrong with the building, honestly speaking. And uh, yeah. we can discuss it then. And, and then perhaps uh, we would like to also show you a rendering drawing of what we propose for the building to be on the upcoming meeting as well. And we can actually provide even a, a plan layout of how the offices will look and whatnot. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds fair so to me. Uh, we can do some rendering drawings yeah. and then we can take it from there. And, then with and the... Uh, you know, does your... Does your preparation of, you know, new buildings, Anthony, include, you know, compliance of uh, the new construction with all current building codes and requirements? All right, we can hear you. Can you speak up? Yes, it will be with compliance with all the city standards and the historical standards and the international standards as well for IFC and for IBC. Um, by the way, just to clarify, the Historic Preservation Office has not received plans for new construction. So we can't comment on no, what's been proposed and whether or not it conforms with the guidelines. Excuse me? Now, what we're saying is that we'll provide you on the upcoming meeting some rendering drawings and the plan layout with the structural okay. report as well. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Ivan. I just have a, a question uh, for one of the commissioners. Actually, Eddie, uh, just wanted to ask you if you your recommendation would also be to include a, some sort of environmental report, or do we all think as a group that just the structural report is enough? I, um, I'm speaking from uh, my professional experience, and I would say that... Uh, you know, an environmental report would be certainly value, be valuable, um, but the remediation of any fire damage structure um, is difficult. I don't feel that uh, Mr. Biganowski exaggerated it in any way, uh, you know, his description regarding the smell, you know, of the structure, about the possibility of removing the smell. Those are things that are incredibly challenging and typically in projects what, what has to be done is that you um, you remove all those materials um, without 
knowledge of what exactly was in there. A lot of things melt, displace, move, work their ways into cracks, other things. Water used to extend, extinguish the fire then, you know, spreads that around the building. And so it is a complicated process, and that hasn't been exaggerated. Um, if you were going to move forward with stabilizing the building, removing these elements in an effort to restore it, an environmental you know, study would, would certainly be warranted and necessary. Um, an insurance company would often require that as well. Um, I don't know if this was ever an insurance claim, but typically in those situations, <clears throat> those, are, those are often things that are executed by an insurance company as they assess the damage. But um, it's, a good, it's a good point to make, Ivan, um, just for the safety of the occupants and anybody inside moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, if, yeah, and I'm agreeing with Ivan too in certain aspects because if we would provide an asbestos report, it would actually be to the benefit to show, you know, in the condition that the building is, especially in the bottom area when we went into the crawl space. The crawl space was pretty much just wood trusses below, and now they're very fragile due to all the fires that have occurred during the years. <coughs> Well, have have your have your engineer evaluate those because typically, um, you know, typically what occurs with wood structures is that there is a char charring effect, and that charring effect, depending on the species of wood, um, expresses itself at a certain depth, and once that depth has been achieved, then the wood really is no longer damaged, um, and so it, it it has a way of charring and protecting itself, and so it needs to be evaluated for what remains for the effective section of each one of those members and and their assembly within the framing plan at the floor and the roof. Of course, and then we have to take in consideration the natural elements as well because all around the crawl space there's openings and you know you keep in mind that you have water, you have wind, you have termites, you have all these access elements that are working around it. Yeah, no, I right, certainly we'll agree. For the next meeting. Okay, it will not be an issue. We'll have you the full report and uh, we can go over it prior or during the meeting if you want to. All right. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. Um, yeah, at this point, we're just looking for more information, you know, and I, you know, any of the other commissioners have different thoughts, feel free to say something, but. I think we all have a sense of realism here as to, you know, what is remaining of this building and what's too far gone, at least by the limited number of images we have. Um, by no means, I mean, I'm personally not expecting you to go ahead and try to repaint over that, you know, charred dual post on the stairway or something, or try to put new plaster on the, the that lath that's on the wall. like. A little bit of realism is, is, you know, I have everything in, in the scope of this, and Mr. I think... Mr. Chairman, yes, I think we have to make an honesty to tear this thing down and then rebuild it to specs, you know, to whatever we need. I'm sorry, Mr. Macias. It's not used for the pictures that... Mr. Macias. He, you know, you can't rehabilitate it. And I think we're just wasting his time, wasting ours. Let him tear it down and rebuild it. Thank you for your... That's my opinion. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, um, does anybody else have questions or comments on this item? Hi. Uh, the design will be, be done under the McAuliffe District Standards. That's where we're going to be getting our architectural ideas from, and then we're going to be complying with everything that is that on our behalf. Yes, please speak with the uh, Historic Preservation Officer on any questions in that regard, because they're more than willing to help you. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, I'd like to make a motion to table this meeting for the next HLC meeting, or this item for the next HLC meeting, sorry. I'll second that, but this one is yes. 
Okay, motion is seconded. All those in favor, I will go individually. Um, this is DJ and I vote yay. Ricky, I vote yay. Mark, Ivan. I vote yay. Ivan, I vote yay. Shane, I vote yay. Chris, yay. Yeah. All right, just for what clarification. That? Yeah, that was a unanimous yay, correct? Yes. Okay. All right, in that case, we'll move on to item number four. Um, thank you very much for this conversation. Um, you know, this is a big item, and I really do appreciate the input you provided us because this is the start to, yes, you know, a big project. So thank you. May we be excused, please? Absolutely. Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you. We're going off now. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening. Okay. Item number four. Okay. Item number four is the certificate of appropriateness for re-roofing the asphalt shingle in a different color for the property at 25, 2815 Wheeling, which is located in the Manhattan Heights Historic District. It's owned R3H, which is residential historic. It was constructed in 19 and it is contributing building. 1918, it's a contributing building. The property is located here, so it's not around the corner. It's almost at the center of the block on Wheeling. Okay, And this is the picture that was taken about 2000 during our last survey. So you can see that the shingles on the roof are kind of brownish. This is what the property looks like today. And it appears that the same shingles are on there, but the property owner needs to re-shingle. He needs a new roof. Now, in order to expedite the process, we did give him approval for re-roofing in brown to match the existing, but he's decided that he'd really rather pursue a different color. He really wants to go with this Sierra Gray. So, we looked at the Sandborn map to see if that could give us any clue. It doesn't really tell us much. Of course, you know, Sandborn maps can only tell us so much. In this case, it doesn't tell us what the color of the shingle was or anything like that, but this property was there. So we looked at other properties in the district, especially on this block. We see a lot of browns, as you can see here, but once in a while, there's a gray or two. And it's the property across the street, which is also brown. It's the property adjacent, also brown. And this is the property, also next door. So you see a lot of colors in the district. Overwhelmingly, though, we do see a lot of brown because that's the color that's closest to a wood-shaped shingle. Uh, we certainly suspect this, happened, this did have a wood shake shingle at one point, but there's no record of it at this time. So we gave the property owner the options. He originally went through with the administrative review, but as I said, he's decided to pursue a Sierra Gray. So we're recommending approval with the modification based on the following. The design guidelines for El Paso's historic district sites and properties recommend that the distinctive features of each roof type should be retained as they are character defining elements. If a roof requires repair, the replacement materials must match the original or existing materials as closely as possible. Do not change the style of construction of the roof. The Secretary of Interior Standards recommend that the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. Removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize the property shall be avoided. Each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Changes that create a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other buildings, shall not be undertaken. Distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a property shall be preserved, and deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. Where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature, the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities, and where possible, materials. Replacement of missing features shall be substantiated with documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. And the modification is that the new roofing be an asphalt shingle in a brown color to closely approximate a wood shingle. All right, thank you, Proby. Um, so you were saying this property is seen on a sandborn map, correct? Yes, did you see that page, DJ? I did, but it's tough to see because the, um, yeah, the screen is a little small. Okay. Let's see if I can get you that. And I would say this is a sandworm map that went back to about 19, God, I want to say 4750 or so. Uh -huh. I couldn't find it any earlier than that. Okay. But we know the building is older than that. We just didn't have access to sandworm maps any earlier than that. Mm. Okay. But it's here, DJ. It's towards the right of the screen where it says Wheeling North Piedras. Mm hmm. And it would be, give me a second, because I can't see it with my eyes either. 
I believe it's the third property in from the right. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious because typically they they signify what the roof material is. Mm -hmm. You know, by the little symbol, um, and it's impossible to see here without zooming in. And unfortunately, I don't think I can zoom in here. Um, I was just curious if this house had that symbol on there or not. I can't see DJ. Sorry, I'm looking at the sandboard on my big, big screen. Yeah. Yeah, and we only have access to sandboard maps online. I cannot see if the roofing material was called out. But being that this is, sorry. More of a bungalow style. Constructed in 1918 in El Paso, I would bet overwhelmingly it was probably a wood shake. Yeah, especially after looking at that, you know, the pediment above the um, the front porch. I mean, that's all wood shingle right there. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that would have been definitive on whether or not. But since you said that was from that sandborn was from the 40s or 50s, mm -hmm. it's possible the roofing it's material been all on the way. Yeah, it could have been replaced even then. So that wouldn't have been accurate. Okay, um, does anybody else have questions for Provi? All right, if there are no other questions, is the property owner or building representative available? Uh, give me one second, DJ. Okay. Mr. Chavez, are you there? Just one second, DJ. It looks like he's muted. Okay. Mr. Chavez, can you unmute yourself? We can't do it from here. Just a moment, DJ. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Okay, no problem. What? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chavez, have you unmuted yourself? Can you hear us? I don't know, did you? That's him. Probably is it star six to one mute? Uh, yeah, we sent him an email saying that. Let's try and give him a call. Okay, give us a minute. Can you? That's him. That's his number. Can you call him? Sure. This is him, the two one three. Do you want to call from here? Sure. Give us a minute. We're having some technical issues. We're going to give him a call. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can be videos.
Okay, so we got in touch with the property owner and he said that he's having some trouble in muting himself. So we asked him to hang up and try again. Okay, thanks for the update. Sure. Let's see if this works. Mr. Chavez, can you Hello. hear us? Yes, can you hear us, Mr. Yes. Chavez? Okay, yes, great. Yes, I can. So, can you hear me? Yes. Would you just, just go okay. ahead and introduce yourself, please? My name is Ernesto Chavez. Uh, I'm the, I'm the uh, owner of 2815 William Avenue. All right, good evening. Good evening. Okay, does anybody have questions for the property owner? Okay, um, this is DJ. Uh, I do have a question. So, when you were looking at these shingles, I saw you're using Owens Corning. Um, are these duration shingles or Oak Ridge or a different product? They're duration. Okay. They're du from what I understand, they're duration shingles. Uh, the person on the application, you can see that DM Roofing is the person that I'm working with. And that's what he basically showed me, duration shingles. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, hey, that's a good product. So um, I'm glad you're going for that one. Um, I'm just curious about that because of the um, different colors that are available for this product. Um, now, it looks like you're interested in, in Sierra Gray. Um, what's the what's the reasoning for that color choice, if you don't mind me asking? I just, I just thought that the, that the gray would be a, a I looked around, as you mentioned in the meeting, and saw that other houses had gray also. Uh, yes, the house is next door to me, and across the street at St. Albans Church, it's brown. But I just figured it would be cooler, that's all. I mean, it was more like an environmental issue more than anything to try to, you know, what I assumed was helping the environment, to be quite honest with you. And, um, and I also thought that the color that it has right now is kind of boring, but, you know, that's another issue, perhaps. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just curious because, um, I mean, Duration does have a number of browns and tans that are available. And even Duration has specific uh, products on improving, I guess, efficiency by reflecting sun rays uh, away from the house. And there are some shingles that appear to do both you know um that can reflect the majority of the sun's rays while also being a bit more in line with the you know original uh, uh shingle color um, for example amber and driftwood um, seem to be shingle color or they're shingle colors that can mimic wooden shingles um, but they're much lighter than driftwood or another darker uh, color um, is that like are you interested in looking for products like that or are you still set on the gray because i'm just trying to see if we can I, you know i'm not set on the gray i think that once again i was trying to be i was trying to be responsible more than anything and uh, perhaps I should have talked to him a little bit more. I did try to do some research on this also. I do have, I'm a historian. I'm a professor at UTEP in the history department. And so then I looked at Sanborn maps and tried to figure this out. I looked online. I couldn't find anything uh, to try to figure out what the original uh, color might have been. Uh, the 
the the previous owners have done a number of things to this house that, as you can see, it's you know they painted over the brick stuff like that. So I was trying to figure out what that would have been, uh, knowing also just uh, perhaps more information that you might want to know, just because I did do research was about, you know, the materials that were used during that time. It is a bungalow, as you say, and I think it's probably the style of the California bungalow. Um, and so I was trying to, I, you know, I'm in accordance with all of this. I was just trying to uh, be more environmentally friendly and then also uh, get, uh, you know, just maybe alter it just a little bit. Uh, if those other kind of color schemes would work, I, I'm fine with that. I, you know, I'm fine with that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, it's great to hear you're so enthusiastic about this. Um, and, and it's good to hear that you're doing research on your house. I mean, that's fantastic. Um, that's great. Okay. Well, thank you. And that's all the questions I have. Does anybody else have questions for the property owner? All right, well, it doesn't look like anybody else has questions on this. So, um, can again, I ask you, can I, since, since yeah. they don't have questions, I just want to just want to follow up. Sure. So then what are you suggesting then as far as you had a number of colors, basically? Right. Right. And basically, these colors come from, I mean, I'm looking at the Owens Corning website right now. And I am, I'm on that page also, yeah. Okay, great. So if you look just at the duration color tabs, you can see a number of colors. You know, there's amber, brown wood, chateau green, colonial slate, um, going all the way down the line. Um, <clears throat> you know, right off the bat, amber seems like a good compromise because it's very grayish, however, it's also, you know, has a bit of tan in there too. So that does seem to, it, this seems to sit in a gray area. I mean, no pun intended, but um, between what you're looking for and what's approved or pre-approved by the um, Historic Preservation Office and the guidelines. So um, yeah, my goal is just to try to provide a, you know, a compromise between the two. And um, yeah, it's good to hear that you're open to it overall uh, could, could you tell me what the could, so you're mentioning you're saying amber i'm on the page i may not be on the right page okay let's see do i go to browns maybe and then i'll see amber uh, i don't see it i'm sorry that's okay um, i'm taking yeah. way too much of your time no hey it's okay um yeah i'm on the website owenscorning.com slash en dash us slash roofing slash shingles and that has all the colors for all of their products okay um i'm on that also and i don't see it but you're saying that an amber has a gray and it's a brownish and it's yes okay uh maybe what i can do is i can just search it uh... yeah that could be easier You know, I still don't see it, but okay. Um, okay, so then what do we do then? If if that is the case, and if I go with Amber, which seems to be a compromise, do I then, do you then have to approve this and then I contact the roofer about this? Or does the roofer contact you to get the per to get the, the building permit? Well, um, that's actually, good. before you do this, DJ, why don't you give him a minute to go online and look at the color? Yeah. No, so I that think that's exactly what Amber is. Yeah, and while um, while he's taking the time to look, um, yeah, Provi, if if you'd like to provide um, some details on the process moving forward, um, sure. Yeah, go well, right. Well, once the landmark commission approves it, um, we send out a letter. It's the the certificate of appropriateness that states, you know, this item was landmark commission on this date. This is what was heard, and this is the motion that was made. Um, once it's approved, you can actually, you don't have to wait for it. You can send your contractor in right away as long as he brings in a sample that shows what the HLC approves. So this way we're all on the right page. Okay. Um, 
I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the colors, by the way. I'm sorry, but I don't see, I'm not on the right page, I guess, or something. Okay. If um, you go to owenscorning.com slash E as in Edward, N as in Nancy, dash U.S. as in United States, slash roofing, slash shingles. It pops right up. Okay. Okay, I, I don't see it, but, um, okay, uh, Owens Corning, owenscorning.com slash en dash Owens Corning? Do you have that spell correctly? Owens Corning? Yeah, You know, I Sandra, do. let me do this. Are you online now? I can send you the link. How's that? That's fine. Okay, let, let me do this right now. Proby, I can bring it up on the screen if he's watching on YouTube or the city website. Okay, we can try that too. <clears throat> okay, I just sent it, Mr. Chavez. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, Mr. Chavez, our attorney has put it up on the um, on the screen. Can you see that? Um, let me see. Uh, I can see it, but I don't see that. I don't, I have, now I see something. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, and I was trying to go to your, um, uh, I got your email. I'm just I'm having trouble finding the actual. Okay. Got it now. So that I can go out. And I can also look. Okay, I can see it on your screen, <laughs> but for some reason, I can't see it on my computer. Okay, can you see the amber color? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I can see it on your screen, but for some reason, I can't see it on my computer. I think this is great. Maybe we could just drop him the link in the chat. I think uh, if Mr. Charles can press star six again. Okay. Um, there you go. Link in chat. Okay. Oh, DJ put that link in chat, so you should be able to access it. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, good idea about that. Well, I mean, since you can see it on the screen, I mean, that's one option, you know, um, and I feel like that's the grayest of the tan colors under duration shingles. Yeah, I can, you know, it's, can I just tell you it's really weird? I can see it on your screen. When I go to the actual website, and I followed the link that you just sent me, by the way. I was there before, and then I followed that link again. And I can't see it on my hand on my computer screen. I don't know why. I have no idea. But uh, I can see it on your screen. Um, All, right. All right, so what do you think? Uh, you just moved it. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, you know, if I'm going to do that, I might as well just go, well, I might as well just stick with like desert tan then that I had before then, to be honest with you. So, um, and I'm saying that because I can't even see it on my own screen. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Well, that's okay. Um, 
Well, like what Provi said, you know, you will need to provide a physical sample of the shingle you're planning to use to okay. the Historic Preservation Office before work begins. So, um, you know, at least you're able to see uh, amber, you know, and there are right. other colors that are available too. So, um, yeah, instead of focusing on one specific product, you know, we, there are ways that we can work around this. And then you have a little bit of latitude, you know, to to choose, and you know, Provi can help you with that. Um, so, that's you know, those are my thoughts on this. Um, does anybody else have questions after this discussion? Um, anything? Okay. Well, if there are no questions, I'd like to make a motion to approve. This item with the modification, the roofing shingles be a light um, brownish gray. Um, such and, as amber? Yeah, such as amber or equivalent. Um, okay. Owens Corning amber or equivalent. And um, yeah, the decision will be made by the historic preservation officer. I second the motion. All right. Let's bring it to a vote. Um, all right, this is DJ, and I vote yay. I vote yay. Great. Shane, I vote yay. Mm -hmm. Ivan, I vote yay. Mark, I vote yay. Chris, yay. Great. Eddie, yay. Okay. Mr. Macias, you're, you're muted, so can you do a uh, thumbs up for yay or thumbs down for nay? I, I approve this motion, yay. Okay, excellent, thank you. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much, and um, yeah, Pro-V will be able to help you um, with the okay. final color and decision. I, I was able to access the color, by the way, um, now. Uh, Great. Okay, then uh, I'll be in touch with her, or my, the roofer will be in touch, and I can leave now. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And the good work. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. On to the next item. Okay, the, the next item is a certificate of appropriateness for exterior alterations at 209 North Mesa Street, located in the downtown historic district, zone C5H, which is commercial historic, constructed in 1917. It's a non contributing building. Um, I'm going to give you the very preliminaries regarding this proposal because the architect really has to walk you through it. It's kind of unusual. But this property is right in the heart of downtown. It's in between the Crest building and the Buckler building. And this is what it looks like now. Okay. Um, this is this treatment, by the way, is very much in keeping with um, what El Paso has historically done to its older buildings. And we'll go into a little more detail. Okay. But we tried to find old pictures of this building. And this got close a few times. So this building is the building on the corner, which is the Buckler building. The building in question is all the way to the right. It's a small, lighter structure that's about the same. It's about two stories or so. And it's at the very edge, at the right edge of the photograph. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. This is a slightly better view of that building. Okay. Yes. So again, it's right next to where it says Crest Store. And in between the buckler, it's that very light colored building with what appears to be a bay window at the second floor. So the proposal is to use the bones or the structure of that building, but to alter the facade enormously. Okay, so basically the facade is getting a new skin. Okay. So I'm going to show you very quickly the elevations. I'm going to show you the materials, and then I'm going to show you the renderings. So, please take a look at number one, which is in the upper left. That's the proposed facade for Mesa Street. And as you saw, 
This building goes all the way through the block. So it actually has two facades. There's one on Mesa and there's one in Oregon. What you're seeing in the upper left here is what will be seen on the Mesa Street side. What you're seeing here with those three windows, three arch windows, is what you're going to be seeing on the Oregon side. Okay, and here's a closer look. And here's a closer look at the rear facade. So this proposal is very, very unusual because when it comes to historic buildings, what we like to do is we like to see them restored. We like to see them brought back to their, or as closely as we can do, the original configuration. To get a proposal for a new scheme in the building that will alter a facade is something we don't usually see. However, as I said before, this is very much an El Paso tradition, though. Um, when we walk through downtown, I can tell you of a number of buildings where this has happened. There's actually a historic facade underneath. Some of you may remember the mirror building that was demolished several years ago. That was designed by Henry Tros and it had been stuccoed over in the 50s. When they started demolishing that building, it was so well done that they had to actually deconstruct it rather than demolish, and they found original historic fabric underneath that. If you look at the American Furniture Building, okay, um, that facade that you see, that mid-century modern stucco facade, that was put under in 1948. Underneath that is what we believe to be a Trost facade. Okay. Then, kitty corner from that building outside of the district is a small building that says McCoy on it, and it has what's known as a brise soleil, which is basically a mesh uh, wall that goes all the way up the building on one bay, and on the second bay you have more um, <laughs> masonry panels. Underneath that building, we know that there's a very Richardson Romanesque revival type structure that's still intact in many ways. So again, what we're seeing in this proposal is very, very different. But at the same time, we don't know how much historic fabric is left and if it can be salvaged. So I'm going to let the architect present, but until then, I can tell you that we're recommending approvals modifications. The modifications are extensive, not the modifications, sorry, the approval. So you're gonna to have to give me a few minutes to read through this. And if you have it, please go ahead and read yourselves. Okay. I might miss something. So we're recommending approval with modifications based on the following. The downtown design guidelines recommend the way in which materials and finishes are combined determines much of a structure's architectural character. It's important to preserve and complement the character of historic structures through proper design and maintenance. Appropriate materials for the zones include brick, stone, terracotta, glazed tile, and concrete, Non-contributing buildings may use materials which are compatible in texture and color with the predominant materials in neighboring landmarks or contributing buildings. Retain existing masonry and mortar if possible. If masonry must be replaced, match old material with new material as closely as possible in terms of size, color, texture, etc. Retain original color and texture of masonry when possible, and new construction to duplicate some of the masonry detailing found in historic landmarks. Aluminum, vinyl, hardboard, or other synthetic sidings are inappropriate as building materials on historic structures, Although some of these, hang on, Chris, can you hear me? Chris, is this better? Chris, is this better? Can you hear me? Chris never, Chris is always muted. Okay, then we'll just keep going. Okay. Sorry, Proby. That... Could you hear me, Chris? I heard, saw you leaning in. No, no, I was just turning, I was just turning away. I'm, I can hear Okay, you. okay. Uh, metal, vinyl, and synthetic materials may be used when proposed materials match existing material. Original detailing is not altered, window and door trim are properly detailed, and unique finishes are not covered or damaged. New construction should be compatible with existing historic materials and construction details. Metal is usually that of cornice, moldings, gutters, downspouts, roofing, or other exterior building, building details, such as decorative grill work on balconies, windows, and doors. Original metal materials should be maintained when possible. If metal must be replaced, new metal should match the design, shape, and color, if possible, of the original. It is recommended that all shiny metals be painted. Storefronts are crucial elements of the commercial streetscape. The storefronts in downtown along South El Paso Street have had to bear the pressure to modernize and or create a new image as businesses move in and out. In time, the alterations accumulate and result in a drastic change of the original storefront. Determine if the existing storefront is the original or later alteration. Preserve original materials or details and the shape of original openings, otherwise the proportions of the facade will be lost. Replace missing original elements such as transom windows. Storefronts should be fabricated from wood, but metal storefronts will be acceptable provided that the design complements the architectural style of the facade and the surrounding area. Entry doors complement the structure's architectural style. 
Solid or residential type doors in small areas of glass should be avoided. The original size, division, and shape of window display windows should be retained. Glass should be transparent for pedestrian viewing. Bars or offices and storefronts should use blinds or cafe curtains for privacy. The wainscot or panel beneath the display window should be constructed of wood or brick. Plastic and metal sightings are not historic and should be avoided. Signs should not hide or cover any significant detailing and or architectural detailing and or architectural features of the building. Signs shall not exceed 30 square feet in all commercial and manufacturing districts and should not exceed six feet in height. Signs constructed for landmark buildings or sites must be made of materials attributed to the year in which the buildings or site was constructed. Plastics are not permitted. Neon is permissible if implemented appropriately. Flashing, black light, intermittent, or moving light or lights are prohibited. Twirling and or revolving signs are prohibited. Colors should complement the building and or the surrounding area. Fluorescence should be avoided. Design should be innovative and compatible with the building and or the surrounding area. And lettering should not exceed 40% of the total area. Generally, windows constitute the major element in creating the character of a building. A window's shape, size, placement, and decorative trim are important contributing elements of a building's character. Replacement windows should match the same size as the original. In other words, new windows should fill the entire space. The practice of blocking up and or blocking down existing window openings to fit a smaller standard size window should be avoided. Painting over windows, blocking in and or boarding up windows drastically alters a building's character and may result in the loss of its architectural integrity. Horizontal casement or picture windows are not historic and should be avoided. Windows should be evenly distributed horizontally and vertically on all floors. If windows must be blocked due to interior functional needs, the glass window should still be maintained. Blocking should occur behind the window and the blocking material should be painted gray or black. Generally, lighting provides safety and visibility. In addition, it serves a number of other purposes. It provides safe movement of vehicular and pedestrian traffic, provides security and aids and crime prevention. It can accentuate important features, qualities and landmarks, and allows day or night usage of buildings. With a few exceptions, the roofs within the historic district are flat and therefore not visible from the sidewalk. Generally, if the roof of a building is not visible from the street, the use of any appropriate roofing material is acceptable. Windows should be evenly, be evenly distributed horizontally and vertically on all floors. Awnings and canopies are important fixtures that serve a number of functions, protecting pedestrians from the sun and rain, protecting window displays from fading caused by direct sunlight, and they allow reflected light to enter the interior without causing additional heating of the store. Awnings are sloped while canopies are generally flat. Both project from the building and when properly designed, each can provide additional interest to a structure. In general, awnings should be evaluated on an individual basis by the Historic Landmark Commission in order to determine appropriateness and impact to the structure and its surrounding environment. Materials should be compatible with the structure and other elements particular to the historic district, and awnings and canopies should be placed at the top of openings, but they should not cover important architectural details slash elements. Awnings and canopies should be of an appropriate size and scale in relation to the building's facade. Colors on awnings and canopies should be considered carefully. Generally, colors should relate to a structure's overall color scheme. On canopies, signs can be mounted above along its front edge, or shingle signs can be suspended from the ceiling. It is recommended that storefronts re reflect the recessed entry typical of the one and two part commercial type. Determine if the existing storefront is the original or a later alteration. Preserve original materials or details and the shape of original openings, otherwise the proportions of the facade will be lost. Replace the missing original elements, such as transom windows. And the Secretary of the Interior Standards recommend the following. Most properties change over time. Those changes that have acquired historic significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. New additions, exterior, altera all exterior alterations, or related new construction will not destroy historic materials, features, and spatial relationships that characterize the property, New additions and adjacent or related new construction will be undertaken in such a manner that, if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. The modifications are that the arch windows on, Oregon Street, on the Oregon Street facade be reconsidered and that documentation demonstrating that the original facades no longer remain be submitted to the Historic Preservation Office. Can you go over that again real quick, Proby? No. <laughs> no, I'm tired. That takes a lot out of me. <laughs> that was impressive. Thank you. Um, my turn? Uh, actually, hang on. DJ? DJ, did I, you fall asleep? I'd like to recuse myself from voting or discussion because I was involved in the design and this um, 
design is coming out of my office, so I'll be abstaining from any conversation or voting. Thank you. I have a question for Pro-V as far as um, the arch windows. Can you show us the ones that you're talking about, Pro-V? Yes, of course. Okay. This is it. Yeah, you had it. Okay, you just it right there. This is it. Exactly. This is facing Oregon Street. Mm -hmm. These are the arch windows that I'm talking about. And I guess the concern is that they don't match some of the buildings. Um, yeah, it's just a different element. Um, I don't see anything on the building that relates to an arched window. Sure. So that's why I said be reconsidered. Yeah, I can get into that when we're ready. Okay. All right, thank you, Provi. Um, any other questions for Provi before the architect comes in? No? All right. I'll go right ahead. I'm really looking forward to seeing this presentation. So. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for taking the time and hanging in there with us. Uh, this building is one of the more challenging projects I've ever been a part of here in El Paso or anywhere because it's not one building. It's like four buildings. They Frankenstein the hell out of this guy. They went over alleys. Um, usually when we're doing as builds for a project, when we do something like this, you know, we can measure it and draw it within a week. This one almost took two months. Uh, serious structural investigation, and um, I can provide you a resume, Eddie, if you'd like to see it. But we were, uh, we were very, it was very difficult because we tried, the whole goal was to try to work with what we had, and a considerable amount of the historic fabric had been removed, even from your slides. Like if you look at slide 57, Pro-V, mm -hmm. and in and, and the old picture that you were showing us, I think it was slide 59, if you okay. want to pull them up there. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you look at, for example, on the Mesa side, which that facade was completely obliter obliterated. Um, look right there at 59, the, the crest sign and the really nice ornate detail work and the cornice and all of that beautiful go to slide 57 you can see they removed two stories of this building and they didn't do it well when you're looking at um the facade you see how it's in line with the adjacent building and, and then you can see over the end and the green and they they completely removed the facade and several stories i wonder at some point in time if the building in its entirety was demolished and then they just built something in its stead to patch it up because that's not the pretty brickwork you see that's an old terracotta infill and then there's some cmu and there's some brick and they screened it and so there wasn't really a lot of historic fabric to preserve what we tried to work on was you know there was this canopy we'll start with the mesa side you know there was this canopy and that was about it when we started working on the inside there's a lot of fabric still on the inside which I know it's not necessarily part of the scope of what we're doing because of the non-contributing nature of this building, but we're doing so much to preserve as much as we can on the inside. There's some nice tin details. There's beautiful brick that we're exposing and cleaning. We're even ex going to the extent of exposing all of the steel that was used as support and making those decorative, artistic, architectural elements. Now, if you can go to the our proposed facade, Provi. Okay. On, on the Mesa side. Sure. So. You want the renderings or the elevations? The, the renderings probably are just easier and nicer because you can see contextually some of what we're talking about. Um, so because of the fact that we didn't really have a lot of the historic fabric originally there and that the owner wasn't really, it wasn't within his budget to rebuild the entire 
two stores, stories that were demolished. The idea was that we would take our cues from what we think are one of the better buildings in El Paso, which is the Crest. So you can look in, and I know that you guys have all of these details, and I can't really scroll through this to pick it apart, but every line on that facade, both horizontal and vertical, every gesture is intentional, and it derives from trying to contextually match what's around it. So you can see that some of the canopy lining is in line with the crest and with the adjacent building. The vertical spacing is we're trying to replicate some of the bay spacing on the adjacent buildings and window spacings and things like that. And even the materials, I know that because it's non-contributing, we didn't have, we have a little bit more flexibility, but the weathered steel look that is present currently in the crest, that core 10 is what we decided to use as a guiding factor in the design aesthetic. Um, because the original facade of the building is gone and it's infill, we're essentially opening it all up to glass behind that screen, which you can see in the elevations. And the purpose there is to provide as much natural light and connectivity to the uh, downtown people going through, and then just providing this screen that will take some of those architectural cues and really translate that feeling. And, we're hoping that anybody that was walking by, you know, yeah, it looks modern, it looks different, but it's in line with what's around it. Now, on the Oregon side, if you can scroll to those images or the renderings, please, Provi. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Oregon side was a little in better shape. There's a lot more historic brick. There were windows. Those arched windows are actually existing. The metal... The metal encasement that we're using is not only a decorative element to really enhance the look and feel of those original windows, but because there was a lot of, I mean, there's significant structural damage to all of the penetrations in that facade, we were using the steel also as a reinforcement for that shape of window. So we're not cutting out anything new. We're not taking anything out. We're just trying to accentuate what is there. Uh, minimal work in terms of what is you know, compared to the Oregon to the Mesa side. Uh, we're going to use the same pattern and the same screening on the um, on that elevator shaft that you see kind of to the right. Another little tricky thing about this building is that uh, the adjacent building to the right, where you can see the planter in the bottom right corner, in that top left picture. It's in another building, but that's also part of this project. At some point in time, they acquired the first floor next to the Rhea Market under those three windows. And so this building not only spans the block, but it kind of leaches out into adjacent buildings. And so it was difficult because there isn't any homogenous facade. There isn't any original structure. It was such a patchwork project that we literally are trying to work with the best that we have, trying to preserve as much as we can. Uh, and again, you know, taking the cues from the neighbors, using materials that are similar in some context to what is there, and just really trying to make it... Oh, I forgot to leave out that the first floor is going to be a food hall, an urban market food hall that's going to span the entire block, which is going to work really well in connecting the Mesa street corridor to the plaza corridor really you can be walking down mesa now hang a right walk through this food hall and be able to experience you know the plaza and all the good stuff that's happening on the other end and so there's going to be a lot of interior design elements that help accentuate that and really bring it to life but as far as the facades go i mean it's i know it looks a little bit on the crazy side but it's very intentional in trying to pay homage to what's around us but also differentiate itself as like, hey, this is essentially a new building and it should be of the times and it should be of the materials and it should use methodologies that are consistent with what's going on in the built world today. And this is our attempt at bridging those two ideologies. That's, that's all I got. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, this is an incredible rendering you know i mean just seeing the the vision of the, this building is just amazing because right now it's just so easily forgotten you know i had no idea this was a single building spanning the entire city block until just now and 
to take that idea of this closed off facade on both ends and really punch through it and turn it into this this thing of curiosity by putting all these little you know um like crevices in and punching through the screens and all this like it's really an interesting counter to the the surrounding buildings um i mean even look at the upper right or the upper left photo here you know i mean the crest building and the other building to the right is very monumental with small window openings but this just completely reverses that and um yeah i mean this is fantastic i mean i i love it thank so, you yeah thank no, you. great work well i appreciate that it's been it's been difficult <laughs> trying to piece it all together Oh yeah. Well, hey, you know the the work clearly pays off because I mean it fits really well in my opinion. So, great job. Thank you. Uh, um, does anybody else have comments or questions? All right. Happy hour. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so I would bring up one thing. Um, Probably, I know you wanted or you recommended us to reconsider these arched windows on the Oregon Street side. Um, I, do, I do have a question. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was muted. I didn't realize I was muted. <laughs> so um, the the brick on the back facade on Oregon, where the, it shows like a step. I think right there where you where you have it, um, that image number two. You see okay. kind of the brick, the new brick being offset from the existing crest building. Um, is that currently an existing offset or is it like, are you going to follow the existing uh, face of the of the building or will you be increasing on that towards the street? No, we're the facade on Oregon is nice. There's some good material on there. The brick is existing. It was covered up with layers of tile and plaster that have slowly peeled away and in some parts have fallen off entirely and the brick is exposed so the idea is that we're going to it's it's in good shape and so fortunately for us we don't have to do very much where it steps back is where the building facade changes and it's all stucco and is just infill like the other side and so we're essentially doing the same thing as we're doing on the mesa side Whatever we can preserve, we're preserving, and then whatever is new is going to fit this new design with the steel covering. And then instead of trying to play with that backdrop that's just four different kinds of masonry infill that was plastered over, we're blowing that out, putting glazing floor to ceiling. Because you got to remember also with this long and narrow building, there's not a lot of light infiltration, natural light, to the center areas of it because there's no windows on the side. And so we're trying to open it up as much as possible, but also keep in line this whole design idea and what we're trying to do. So to answer your question, the brick is staying. The openings are existing. Anything that is newer or was an addition, we're replacing with glazing and screening and just showcasing the original design as much as possible. And what will the, the use of the rest of the uh, floors be? As of right now, uh, they are. it's a little tricky, again, because you can't really subdivide it because there aren't windows and natural light. And so their, their proposed use are office and maybe expansion of the restaurant functions to the second floor and basement. But that's currently not within our scope. We're just shelling it out to be able to accommodate. We're putting it down as office. That, that's our recommendation to the owner. Because you have a little bit more flexibility with office space than you do. Like you can't put residential in there. There's no windows. You can't really put commercial. People don't like that upstairs. So it's best use is office. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, and I think that really dovetails nicely with the um, the question or that I was going to ask about the you know, the reconsideration of those three arch windows. Um, yeah, at this point, this building has been modified so many times with permanent modifications that what's left, you know? And I feel like just having these little moments, these little instances where 
you would see just a little hint of what the building would look like or just, you know, even just like a, a small accent, you know, um, really brings out the, the, the story with this. And um, by no means is this a, a restoring a facade or, you know, doing anything to the interior that is in line with the original use, but that's okay, you know? I mean, at this point, it's been modified to the point where the modification is the story, and this is just the next phase of it. So, yeah, I think having those arched windows are interesting, you know? It, it certainly, I don't know, I think it ties in all three buildings pretty well, because the arch windows are in line with the brown building to the right, or to the south, and then the, you know, it, it repeats in a somewhat similar way to what's on the Crest building to the north. Um, they're not the same window sizes or anything like that, but hey, that's okay. This is its own building. So, yeah, I fully support this design as it is because it's really thoughtfully done. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, guys, I'm, a, I'm an architect in my specialty in grad school was historic preservation we've been trying to work on a lot of buildings downtown and Proby, you need to add the abdu building to the list of recent buildings that have received tax credits that we worked on and really? we try to preserve yeah we got them i did not know that excellent yeah yeah they got it went it went swimmingly they were they were really happy with how that turned out but Beautiful. We try to preserve as much as we can, and you could. I mean, I, I'll invite you guys in when when we're working on the inside, or it's 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 open to walk through. It won't fall on you. We can do hard hats if you want to see. But we're trying as hard as we can to preserve as much as we can. I mean, we're even going to the extent of preserving the weird openings between buildings because it just looked like somebody took a sledgehammer to get from one side to the other, and we're preserving that because it looks amazing because you can see all the different layers of the old brick of the adjacent building and the new brick of our building and then kind of this transition to that space it's this really powerful threshold moment like what the hell were these people thinking and look how they did it so we're preserving those things as much as we can so literally on the outside they they, they went to town on pulling it apart and there wasn't much left and so we tried and so i appreciate the uh, kind words i mean it, it's been in our office for a little bit and, you know, the original design that the owner had with a, with a previous group was just really awkward and not fitting in. And so this is our attempt. And I, I, I appreciate that, that we're getting good feedback on it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Anytime. You know, I mean, this is like the it's sort of a foil to the, the Crest building because the Crest building seems to be untouchable, even though it's been abandoned for decades. You know, it's still holding up well. But it's good just the way it is, like a little, you know, globe is around it and you can't touch it. But this, I mean, just seeing the brutal truth of how buildings evolve over time and putting that on display, I mean, that's fantastic. So, um, yeah, great work again. But um, does anybody else have comments or questions or concerns before we move on to voting? Okay, well, if there are no questions, I would like to make a motion to approve this item as proposed. I second the motion, Shane. Okay. Thanks, Shane. All right, if there are no other last minute questions or amendments, um, let's put it to a vote. Uh, this is DJ and I vote yay. This is Shane, I vote yay. This is Mark, I vote yay. Ivan, I vote yay. Vicky, unmute yourself. Eddie. Eddie, yay. Thanks, Eddie. Yay. All right, thank you, Vicky. This is Chris, I abstain. Okay, thank you. All right, is Mr. Macias here? I think he gave a thumbs up, DJ. Okay, great. Sorry, I don't see a screen, so thank you. All right, motion passes. Thank you again for coming to share this with us, and good luck on having this design be made into a reality. 
that's really exciting. Yeah, well, thank you very much, and uh, we'll let you know when it's ready. Okay, sounds good. Thanks Take care, guys. Bye -bye. You too. Thanks. Okay. On to item number six. Okay, item number six is a certificate of appropriateness for construction of a masonry and metal picket fence at 519 Porfirio Diaz Street, located in the Sunset Heights Historic District, zoned R4H, which is residential historic, constructed in 1911, it's a contributing property. So the property in question is this one, and I want you to take note of the shape of the parcel and how big it is. It's slowing down. Okay, just a second here. So the property owner has been working on the property and gotten permits for everything. So we're very grateful about that. Um, I guess they moved in about a year or so ago, maybe less, and they've maintained the property very well. They've painted, they've put in some HVAC, they've done very well with the property. But as you can see, the property is actually wide open. This is it. And the parking is to the right. So what they're proposing is fencing part of the property, okay? The fence would not be at the front property line, it'd actually be towards the back of the house and would encompass a little bit of the side and the rear, okay? And that's fine, we approve new fences all the time, but the fence that they'd like to install is at the bottom right of the screen where it says front view. So it's a little different, okay? It would be masonry, it would be covered with stucco and it would have horizontal pickets rather than vertical, which is a little more traditional. So we looked at our guidelines to see what's appropriate, okay? What's appropriate, as we said, is really what's more traditional and what's traditionally found in El Paso. So you could have metal pickets, you can have a rock wall, um, you can have iron. What's not appropriate would be chain link or something that's a little too elaborate. Um, so what they're presenting is not what we see in the guidelines, so that's why it's coming to you. Okay, and also because if we do approve it administratively, then we're sort of opening the door to these new applications. And we'd rather just stick to what the guidelines say. So we looked at the rest of the properties on the block. This is one of the adjacent ones. These are some of the others. There is some fencing. As you can see, the neighbor here has something a little more traditional. It's been painted over. But what the current property owner wants to do is something just a little different from that. So we're recommending approval with modifications based on the following. Okay. Um, the design guidelines for El Paso's historic district sites and properties recommend that construction of new fences, stairs, or sidewalk rails and replacement of older existing fences is allowed on historic properties provided the proposed site features of a compatible material and scale. Rock, brick, wood, and wrought iron are acceptable materials, but each case is decided individually. Cinder block and chain link fencing are relatively recent developments and are therefore not appropriate fencing materials. The height of the proposed fence should complement the structure, primarily as viewed from the street, and should not obstruct the public's view of the building. Solid walls are appropriate for the side property lines, while an open fencing material is more appropriate for the front portion of the property. Introduce new fences and walls compatible in material design, scale, location, and size with original fences and walls in the historic district and the height of the proposed fence should complement the structure and should not obstruct the public's view of the building. Any proposed fence higher than 32 inches solid or 48 inches open measured from the ground level at front property line or side yard property line on a corner lot shall be reviewed by the HLC. Any proposed fence higher than six feet between buildings on an interior property line or across the rear property line shall be reviewed by the HLC. And the Secretary of Interior standards recommend that property shall be used for its historic purpose or be placed in a new use that requires minimal change the defining characteristics of the building and site and environment. The historic character of property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize the property shall be avoided. And new additions and adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. The modifications are that the new fence shall have vertical metal picket fence and a brick or coarse masonry foundation. Okay, thank you, Provi. Um, any questions? No? Okay. Um, is the property owner or building representative here? Uh, Mr. Chambers, are you there? If you are, can you unmute yourself? Mr. Chambers, are you there? Can everyone hear me okay? 
I'm here. Yes. Can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, I'm uh, Jason Chambers. Uh, my wife and I, uh, Sharika Labrie, we are on 519 for Video Deals here in El Paso. All right, good evening. Sorry for making you wait for so long. Um, okay, so we looked at what Provi provided us, and um, I personally don't have any questions off the top of my head. Do any of the other commissioners have questions or comments on the proposed fencing? Yeah, this is Francisco. I'm sorry, what was that? This is the Commissioner Francisco Macias. Can you hear me? No, we can't. Can you? Okay, can you try again? Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Casillas, but... Can you hear me now? Yes, but it's spotty. It's... It's real spotty, but why if it's not that different than what we have here in El Paso, why can't we just let them do what they want to do? Again, Mr. Macias, we have laws that govern what goes on in historic districts, so we don't let people do what they want to do in historic districts. There are guidelines that they have to follow. The guidelines that were just read to you are the following. Introduce new fences and walls compatible material, design, scale, location, and size with original fences and walls in the historic district. Since this is not traditional, it goes before you. Well, that's what I'm saying. You said that it wasn't that much different than what is usually accepted here in El Paso. And it's still and, not the same. And so what I'm saying is that I think we should let them do what they want to do if it's not that much different. That's my opinion, all right? I understand we have laws. All right, thank you for your opinion. Does anybody else have comments or questions for the homeowner? So, probably I just want to kind of summarize a little bit for clarity. The, the fence itself, you know, is probably the main component that is, I mean, we're kind of used to more vertical Treatments, correct? Correct. Okay. But the columns in between are pretty much matching the neighbor and, and surrounding areas. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah, and just to, uh, to play off of the, the horizontal pickets instead of vertical pickets, um, well, there are two things that come to mind. The first is was it the last HLC meeting or the one before it? Um, we did approve horizontal uh, panels to be installed above a rubble stone rock wall in Manhattan Heights, uh, I think, or Austin Terrace. I think it was Manhattan Heights. Either way, we did set that precedent with that approval. Um, second, I could also see the horizontal pickets work with this property simply because the building has a I mean, it's a, a low slung hipped roof. I mean, it's the emphasis is on, on the horizontal lines. So I could see these pickets be compatible with the design of the house just inherently. Um, in addition, the white cinder block, while it isn't typical for El Paso, um, I mean, even outside of the historic districts, there is a precedent right next door. And, you know, just linking, you know, just tying in that design into this proposal makes sense. Um, now, Provi, just for some clarification, this new fence, like you said, is just going to be on the rear of the property, right? Well, well, 
if we look at, um, hang on here. Okay, there we go. This plan, DJ, in the upper left, the site plan. Right. That solid line okay. is where the fence is going to go. So it's not the front property line. It'll be towards the back of the property. And it's really to encase the side and the rear and a little bit facing the front, but definitely not at the front property line. Okay. All right. Um, oh, I do have a question for the property owner. I haven't had a chance to look through the details and plan or Provi, if you have an answer for this, feel free. Um, I'm assuming the, the CMU blocks are going to be suckled over to match the house, correct? That's what it looks like to me, yes. Okay, all right, just wanted that, to double check. Uh, I'll go ahead and chime in if you guys can hear me. Yeah, yeah that, that's the idea. So it'll be a center block wall with uh, stucco to match the exterior of the home. Um, okay. and I think you brought it up, the, uh, the horizontal, um, I guess, privacy fencing part of the wall kind of goes with all the lines that already exist uh, with the house. So. Um, we're open either way, but but I do think the horizontal would look nice. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, um, I, I think uh, just for clarification, I think on that case that you referenced, uh, DJ, we did approve the horizontal elements, but I think it was for a, a rear wall. It was not at the front, and it seems that to be the same case here. Um, although there is that side fencing that is kind of exposed to the front of the of the street or the front street. Right. Um, but I mean, I don't know that it would make sense that we, we changed vertical in that section and go horizontal to the rest. Maybe, I mean, it'll probably feel a lot better that it's consistent. Um, and I think the fact that it seems about, I don't know, 30, 40 feet away from the front facade of the house, um, I think that also helps. Right. Yeah, I certainly agree with you on that. Yeah, and I'd, I'd much rather see consistency throughout the entire fence design than having different pickets for different sections. Okay, great. Any other questions or, or comments? All right, well, in that case, I would like to make a motion to approve this item as stated. I'll second that motion. All right, thank you. All right, if there are no other amendments, let's put this to a vote. Uh, this is DJ and I vote yay. Ivan, I vote yay. Mark, I vote yay. Ricky, I'll vote yay. Chris, yay. Shane, I vote yay. Eddie, yay. Sorry, Mr. Macias, I did not hear you if you already voted. Um, did you uh, vote yay for this? And I vote yay. Okay, great. Thank you. Just wanted to double check. All right, well, the motion passes. So thank you very much for coming to us. And um, this looks like a, a nice fence design. So thank you again. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Likewise. Okay. okay. So before we move on to the latter portion of the agenda, um, we need to loop back to item number one. Okay, DJ, let's go back to item number one. Okay. Okay, DJ, let me see if the property owner is there. I know he was trying to get in. So, Mr. Gomez, can you hear us? Mr. Gomez, are you there? It says it's muted. Is that from his end or from our end? Okay. Mr. Gomez, if you're muted, can you unmute?
Mr. Gomez, if you're on the phone, press star six. Just one second. Okay, no problem. TJ, I'm going to try giving this applicant a call and see what's going on because okay. I can see that he's there, but somehow it's muted. I just sent him an email. We're not getting through. So give us a minute, okay? Okay, no problem. We asked him to hang up, call again, and to try unmuting. Okay. Let's see how this goes. I say we give the property owner at most two minutes to try to connect with us. And if not, then we'll just have to move forward. And we already gave this property owner an incredible amount of time to try to meet with us. And um, we'll just work through it. See him this one yet, do you? Okay, yeah, give it a minute, DJ. It's kind of confusing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm the last to really say anything. I was already 10 minutes late to this meeting because of the same thing, so it's all right. Okay, there he is. So, okay, let's try that. Mr. Gomez, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So basically, Mr. Gomez, what we did is we went over um, the issue with your property. Okay. Right. So, mm -hmm. Right. We discussed how you originally come in for a permit. We asked for some pictures and we saw that there had been alterations and we couldn't find any approvals yes. or permits for them. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, so it's just like a computer. And? Okay, so what we're recommending is a modification. The modification is that the concrete pad be removed from your front lawn 
and no permits are issued for the property until everything is in compliance. Is there something you'd like to add? Would you like to tell us what happened with the windows and the concrete pad and when that happened? Uh, this has been a uh, few back, uh, but nothing changed on the modifications of the window. They're the same size and the pad. It was uh, in order to fit uh, two vehicles in the front. But it doesn't change anything about it. I know you're here to preserve the, uh, you know, view, but... So, Mr. Gomez, do you have a garage on the property? Uh, where do you normally park? Mr. Gomez, are you there? I think we lost them. Mr. Gomez, are you there? He's not muted. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so can you tell us, do you have a garage yes. on the property or where do you park? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, about 10 years ago, I applied for a permit for, uh, for to make an apartment in the garage and not changing any of the structure. Okay, so when you did that, you gave up your parking space, I imagine. Right, I did. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So I applied for a permit for... Mr. Gomez, this is Ivan. I think you have your your computer or your TV on uh, with the video. I don't know if you can turn it on yes. so that it doesn't come through because it's coming through the call. Ah, okay, then let me turn it off then. Oh. There. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm hmm All right, well, thank you um, again. This is DJ and um, yeah, the problem with this is the concrete pad was installed without any notification to the city's historic preservation office or the historic land right. commission. So that's what's leading us to this problem right now. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, we just need to figure out how to proceed. Um, and that's the challenge because if this, if this concrete pad was proposed to us before any work was completed, we would have worked with you to provide an alternative, um, to some degree to try to accommodate extra vehicles that were displaced from the, um, from changing the garage to an apartment. But um, since we're doing this after the fact, um, previously when we've had items like this, the HLC voted to remove these concrete pads. Um, and if we break from that here, this would set a precedent. And that's the big challenge because it's not just about your property, it's also about all of the other potential violations down the road. So, that's what's going on right here, at least from my perspective. Um, does anybody have questions or comments for the property owner? All right, well, I mean, I'm not specifically an architect with this, so I just want to talk about this with the commission. Um, are there any options to modify the existing concrete pad to make it less noticeable? You know, I mean, I know it's much easier to do it 
while the concrete is wet. I mean, just putting down, mm -hmm. you know, like a pebble dash, you know, feature over it or something along those lines or a texture over it to make it hide um, is good. But I mean, after the fact, are there any options the property owner can pursue? Could you bring up a pi the picture of the house as it is now, please? Sure. Just go down one. Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, I think maybe removing the, the maybe five feet from the edge of the house, you know, so it seems like it's a little bit floating away from the face. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not going to hide it, but um, at least it doesn't feel like a patch piece, you know, like it was placed as a functional pad, but I don't know that it was to enhance the, the look of the house, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a good option. Because, I mean, that, that what we're discussing here is to demolish it completely, right? Right. Get rid of the pad, yeah. The, oh. the, the picture prior to this shows actually two cars in the driveway, which is what evidently the goal was. So I don't, I, I would point out that the change in the windows is a change uh, and that you are recommending that they be that be reversed so that's fairly generous in itself hmm. i mean there's another option after looking at this photo to remove the existing concrete pad and install a new one to the left of what i suppose is the original driveway um, and just bring that concrete all the way to the the rock wall um so it's an option however i suspect it's more expensive just off the top of my head it clearly yeah. would have been a full um choice had it been brought to us originally right right at whatever if New concrete were put in, it should certainly be a mute color from the beginning. Right. Okay. All right, Mr. Gomez, are you still on the line? Yes, I am, uh, but I don't want to play the, pa the part of, uh, you know, a dummy person, but these contractors uh, come up to your door and, you know, they don't mention anything, but this was, uh, like I said, more than seven years ago, you know, and, and it does not on top of any water lines. It's, I don't see how it really should affect the view of the house, you know, or... But. Well, I mean, the if we look at this house, the main block of the house is the mm -hmm. gable portion, you know, the part that's painted, you know, you see the blue gable, the white shingles underneath. Um, as right. it presently stands, the concrete pad encourages cars to park right in front of the main part of the house. Right. Um, in addition, the historic district guidelines notes... Um, the no, Provi, correct me if I'm wrong, but the front and sides of the property need to have at least 50 or need to have 50% ground cover, like green ground cover. Correct. Right. Uh -huh. um, that's correct. Um, yeah, someone is redoing the front yard. We ask at least 50% be living ground cover. Right. The okay. other 50% or less can be some kind of paving. Right. Okay. So these are the, the items that we're pulling from. You know, just the general layout of your house, and then also what's right. um, outlined in the guidelines. 
So um, between these two options, you know, um, Yvonne, one of the commissioners, brought up the idea of removing the closest five feet of the new concrete pad away from the house. So there's a bit of right. a, a gap between the house and the concrete pad. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other proposal is to remove it all together and install the concrete on the side of the property between the driveway and the stone wall. So then cars would park on the side of the property and leave the front of the house, the main portion of the house, unobscured. So those seem to be the two options where you know this discussion is leading to. Um, but before we go any further, I would like to see what your input is on both of those options. Well, you know, all these options that are you're coming up, you know, it's uh, very, they sound uh, very expensive, you know, and I, I think, you know, I mean, the, the front view was not modified. I'm still in the same thinking, you know, and I know you got to have so much green in there, but I don't, you know, I really don't understand. If, and if I, if there were another option to just uh, put a, you know, maybe a hefty fine or something, I would rather, you know, instead of tearing it down, I would rather go with that, you know, if it's possible. Well, unfortunately, I can't speak on behalf of any sort of fines for this. Um, from mm -hmm. what I understand, our ordinance does not, you know, um, give out monetary fines. Um, uh -huh. However, the, the big issue now is the proposal is if, you know, we need to make a decision because this application is, it expires in three days. Okay. So, um, yeah, and you're right. I mean, any of these modifications will cost some kind of money. And that's, right. what's, you know, that's what's the big shame about this because, um, yeah, I mean, it'll cost something. So <clears throat> that's why I do like Yvonne's idea, because, I mean, I don't know how much it would cost, you know, w whether one is more expensive than the other, but at least Yvonne's idea would allow you to keep the existing pad to some degree. Um, and then you won't have to, to lay down a new concrete pad somewhere else. Um, another option is to, you know, plant something in front of the concrete pad, so then it's somewhat obscured and somewhat hidden from the street view. Um, okay. I mean, that's an option. I mean, I don't know what the other commissioners think of it. Um, in fact, I'd really like to hear from the other commissioners on what they would think, because, you know, right now we have three options on the table. Two of them are very expensive. One, you know, planting things may seem a bit more reasonable. However, there are irrigation costs, you know, you do need to water the plants on some basis, depending on what type of plant it is. So, um, yeah, I really welcome any other um, comments from the commissioners before we go to any sort of vote. This is Shane Mercer. Um, I don't know that I have a, a better proposal. I, I just want to address something that the property owner said. You know, we don't, we're not trying to create a, a financial hardship for you or um, cre create any kind of expense. But understanding, I just want to clarify that, that you're correct, that it, it isn't blocking a view of the home. Um, but the design guidelines for historic districts for the city specifically state that non-traditional site features such as concrete pads uh, should be placed where they are not visible from the street. And this clearly is. So that's that's what we're considering here. Uh, it's an unfortunate situation, but but this violates the, the guidelines and, and understand you didn't intend to do that. But we also don't want to um, we don't want to set a precedent where we would allow something like this, because what if everybody decides to pour concrete in their front yard and, and then years later right. come before us and expect us to grant an exemption for that. So, so we ha do have to 
we do have to hold a standard here. So, so that's what we're considering. DJ, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that there is a great option. Um, how expensive or does somebody have an idea of what kind of cost we're looking at? What's the difference in, in taking out five feet of concrete as opposed to all of it? Um, in, in re-pouring it. Yeah, Shane, I, I'm right there with you, you know. Um, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. If anybody does, feel free to say something. Um, but you're right, you know. I mean, we're, we're not here to purposely cause financial hardship, you know. It's, it's about towing that line between upholding the guidelines and standards and just being reasonable. Um, yeah, and in this case, yeah, this is a tough one. So, um, I think, uh, I mean, cutting off a piece would be a lot less expensive than repouring a, a, a whole pad. Um, mm -hmm. With what you're mentioning, DJ, maybe, I mean, now I'm creating a combo effect, but maybe we uh, we go ahead and propose that landscape is placed around the, the pad as well, you know, so that it doesn't uh, become that precedent that Shane mentions that everybody in the future can just pour concrete. You know? Yeah, um, it kind of gives them a limit as well, and and it helps hide it from the from the front. Yeah. No, I certainly agree. You know, I mean, there's plenty of drought tolerant plant life that can creep over concrete as well as act as a vertical shield or a vertical, you know, barrier, um, depending on the use um, and I'm saying drought tolerant just to reduce the the maintenance on it um, this is this is Shane again Proby can we go to, to slide seven just to see the um, the concrete the pad mm -hmm. yes please Just an observation, it's not just a concrete pad, it's a concrete pad and, and it will have a vehicle on it, so it changes the front of the house to a parking lot, through actually, and to find a way to approve, approve it, 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 we're reversing what we've done many times before in other other historic districts. And I think that the compromise on to the left side of the driveway, it, it's less offensive, particularly if there were the planting between the street and the and the parking pad, but. I, do, I don't see it as anything but it, intrusive. Yeah, I think you are, you're right. It's important to remember it's not just the pad, but also the vehicle on top. Um, and, it's, uh, and, and generally, if you look at this picture, you're going to have the vehicle there before you have the vehicle in the driveway. Yeah. <laughs> It's more than that, and it, it's also the question of consistency. Yeah. Ivan, if you put that, uh, your thoughts in the form of a motion, I'll second it. Well, okay. yeah. I think uh, some of the arguments that Vicky made are also Valid. Yeah. yeah, but we, we we start to become a punitive about it if we don't if we start doing it to the less fortunate that can't hire an architectural uh, company to advise them about how these uh, of how these uh, unscrupulous constructors uh, take advantage of them. you know uh, you know it was. It was a tremendous job that they did on that downtown uh, office, but they had an architect and an architect that is taking graduate studies in historical preservation. This guy can't afford an architect that has a master's in historical conservation, 
So, I mean, if you do it in the form of a motion, I'll second it. I, I think yeah. though, that you have to look at that El Paso has, but you don't have to be an architect to understand the standards in the book. The standards, if you remember the last one that we looked at, was quite well um, there are descriptions and illustrations throughout the standards. They're not, they're very straightforward. And they're fairly simple by comparison to what I've seen in other historic districts and other. Yeah, I'm wondering if this guy even knew he was buying into a historical neighborhood when he bought the house. It. Uh, he, he'll have to go back and talk to the real estate are required to disclose. Okay, well, let's get back to the item at hand and try to come up with a good solution. Um, Mr. Macias, you are correct. You know, um, not everybody can afford the full services of somebody. Um, who would be you know, fully aware of these these um, considerations that need to be made? On the other hand, yeah, I mean, we would be setting a precedent if we didn't do something to address this. So, um, I would like to make a motion. Actually, before I make a motion, Vicky, I mean, sorry, Vicky, um, Provi, quick question. Are there any sort of like services or assistance the, the city can provide for homeowners who are in situations like this, just providing just general guidance or ways to, to help? Um, well, uh, you know, our office is always available and our everything that we do is pretty much online. Okay. Um, I know that the Department of Community Development does have a program that does assist people of a certain um, economic status with improvements to the homes. So that might be an option. Okay. And what I also like to point out is that, you know, staff, we have taken a look and we have said, look, we know that this is expensive and it will be a bit of a financial burden. But we're not asking that he remove the windows that we cannot find a permit for at this point. And he said that the garage had been turned into living space. So if it had been turned into living space, the parking should have been addressed at that point. And we have, again, there's nothing online that shows that there's a permit for any of that. So on the one hand, we're not asking that he remove all that and take out the wall and make it back, turn it back into a garage. We're asking that you just remove the parking pad. Plus, there is that space to the left of the property that you said used to be a driveway. It could have been some way to access the back that seems available. It looks to me like he could park there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Provi. Um, with that and, said, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, DJ. Um, sure. This is Shane again. Remind me, um, what was the catalyst that that brought this to our attention? Is there a pending permit that was requested, and what was that for? Yes, the owner asked, um, submitted a request for HVAC equipment. Okay. So when that happens, we ask for some documentation, one of which is always a photograph of the main facade of the house to make sure that we're all talking about the same property. And many times that has led us to discover alterations that were done without permits. So we then look into the permit history to see if there's anything there that says that this is legal. We couldn't find it in this case. And in those cases, we ask the property owner to take care of that before we go ahead and approve anything else on the property. Uh, understood. And, and that's the point I want to make. Just publicly here with the property owner um you know we're not this isn't a fine as the chairman said we, we can't impose that um it, it's essentially i mean you're going to have to make a decision you don't have to remove this right away um but if you're going to move forward with the with the hvac system and other requests that, that you will have to to do that at some point um is remove that pad um I don't know, DJ, I, I'm open to whatever motion anybody makes. I don't have one. I, I just don't see how we can in good faith. I, I, I'm with Vicky on this. I, I don't I don't see how we can in good faith just allow that that pad to stay as is, what, what, just where it's located. Um, yeah. Yeah, no. I, I get that. The other thing that I would say is you have to look at the, uh, the rest of the houses of the neighborhood that probably 
showed us that this is inconsistent with the front yards of any of the other homes that she showed us. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to um, make a motion and we can continue a discussion or we could vote on it or what have you. So my motion is to um, approve the HVAC equipment that is proposed to be replaced and remove the concrete pad that's currently in front of the house to the east of the driveway and install a new concrete pad to the west of the driveway up to the rock wall. Um, and if that is unfeasible financially, um, I strongly encourage the property owner to notify the Historic Preservation Office and work with us so then we can see this in a different item and um, move from there so that we can look at different options. That was a motion, correct, DJ? Yes, that was a motion. I, I, I second the motion, Shane. Okay, thank you, Shane. Does anybody have comments, questions in regard to that motion? I would like to amend that. that the um, requiring that the pad on the left be the same color as the driveway and um, and that it not go to the uh, public sidewalk be as far back as the one that's being removed. And, and I think it would be fine if they just said that the plan be brought to pro for uh, concurrence before they uh, go forward with it. Right. So just a quick summary. Your amendment is to move the proposed concrete pad that's that will be left or uh, west of the driveway back so there's a gap between the sidewalk and the new concrete pad and that the color match the driveway okay okay yeah i mean those are two reasonable amendments in my opinion moving the concrete pad back the new concrete pad back and having it match the color of the existing driveway. Um, Shane, do you still second that motion with the amendments? I, I don't want to make this complicated. I, I, I understand it. I, I, I worry, I, just it's hard to tell from this image that we have what that spacing would do and how, how much square footage that would be. Um, I think we want to uh, mention it. Say it seems like I, 10 feet. We can give him a measurement. Yeah, we just say okay. like I, ten feet away. Yeah, if, if I don't want to put words in Vicky's mouth, but I, I, I would. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy with saying a, a ten, a ten, foot offset from the from the public uh, sidewalk there. How about um, we? give them a little bit more room, you know, like having no less than five feet of a setback. That, I, that I'm, I think that's, I think that's good. Okay. I think that I, makes sense. And that, and that the setback be landscape. Well. And that doesn't mean landscape, a hardscape, but it needs to be differentiated. I'm going to withdraw my second, DJ. I, I, I'm not, yeah. this is a little bit more than what I was agreeing to. Um, yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, Vicki, I mean, when it comes down to it, I mean, we have to think about priorities. Like, I understand that, that you know, landscaping will help. I, However, you know, I mean, the... I don't even really the, mean landscaping. 
maintaining. I meant something differentiated. Obviously, he isn't maintaining the grass that he has. So, if if that's it back five feet, which is fine, uh, it, uh, it just seems to me then it's just going to be dirt that he's going to drive on. So it doesn't setting it back doesn't mean anything. Do I make? Does that make sense? No. I mean, I'm not sure they're not already parking on the left-hand side already. It's, uh, it doesn't look like it's been maintained in a long, long time. Right. But do we, do we have any authority to determine where they, I mean, is there any reason they can't park there currently? I mean, I, you know. I'm not I, saying, I mean, that yeah. we, you know, we may have a, like a five-car driveway here. We're reducing it to a a three car three or four car driveway i don't know what this looks like when everybody's home if he's made an apartment out of the um carport or garage all right well i mean just for the sake of time um i mean this meeting is already going on almost two hours at this point we still have a good number of items to do um vicky thank you for these amendments um however I'm only going to support two of them, um, putting a five foot setback at least on the new concrete pad and having the concrete be compatible with the existing driveway. Um, That's fine. Okay. Uh, I'll second that. Okay. Thank you, Shane. So just uh, so that we're all on the same page, the second in motion is to remove the existing concrete pad to the east of the driveway, install a new concrete pad to the west of the driveway um, with a setback no less than five feet from the public right of way and be colored to be compatible or to match the, um, the existing driveway. And um, that's, that's basically it. So there are no other comments or questions, I would like to put this to a vote. So this is DJ and I vote yay. This is Shane, I vote yay. Mark, this I vote Vic. yay. Chris, I vote yay. yay. All right, thank you. Ivan, I vote yay. Okay. Eddie, yay. All right, Mr. Macias. Sorry, your uh, video isn't up, so. Am I unmuted? I can hear you, yes. Okay, good. I abstain. Okay. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. As I said, I mean, this is, I want this to be seen as a process and not just a conclusion, you know. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Gomez, I please like work with Pro-V, with, work with the Historic Preservation Office. And if it doesn't work out, that's OK. You know, you can always come back. Um, we can always revisit this. So um, I apologize again for so much difficulty for um, making this meeting happen. But at the same time, I really appreciate the time you've taken to um, to talk with us. So thank you again. Thank you all. All right, have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, we are done with the big items for the day. So let's look at the... Uh, sorry, I'm just putting up the agenda real quick. Okay, um, item number eight. Let's look at the administrative reviews real quick, and then we can vote on them. Oops.
Okay, any questions, comments, concerns about the administrative reviews? Okay, in that case, I would like to make a motion to approve these reviews as stated. Second. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. This is DJ and I vote yay. Ivan, yay. All right. Thank you. Mark, yay. Okay. Chris, yay. Shane, yay. All right, thank you. Francisco, yay. Eddie, yay. Okay. Mr. Macias, sorry, um, you're cut off. Uh, yay. Okay. And then Vicky, just for clarification, you voted yay as well? Yes. Okay. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right. You unanimously approved. Um, let's move on to the meeting minutes from the last meeting from August 17th. Okay, does anybody have comments, concerns, questions about the meeting minutes? Okay, if there are no questions, I'd like to make a motion to approve these minutes as stated. Second. All right, thank you. This is DJ and I vote yay. Ivan vote yay. Vicky, I vote yay. Mark, I vote yay. Chris, yay. Shane, yay. yay. Okay. All right, I didn't hear anything from Chris or Eddie. So I, I think I was not in attendance for that meeting, so I'm oh, yeah. abstaining. Abstain. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And Chris, are you still? Yeah. Sorry about that. It's hard. It's hard to keep track. I, I abstain. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So we're done with those reviews. <clears throat> Take another look at the agenda. Next item is discussion and act on, action on chapter 2020. So, Provi, how are things looking? Okay, things have been rather quiet and rather dormant. Um, as I said last time, we gave the DMD, the Downtown Management District, the latest version, and we gave them up to about mid October to get back to us because we said we understand that everybody's still rather busy. We haven't heard from them, so, and I suspect that we won't um, in time for our next meeting, which should be October 5th, but probably after that. And we honestly think that this is the last hurdle, if you will. After that, we then prepare. We will give and bring it back to you for a final review. Um, mm -hmm. And then we prepare to take it forward once you approve it to City Planning Commission, which goes on City Council, and City Council can then approve the changes. So it's still ways off. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, just in the grander scheme of things, I mean, I, have you had a chance to talk with anybody, you know, any of the staff at city council or anything about what's going on? Like, is there any, I guess, 
insight on what city council is thinking nowadays because the last time we were you know we presented this it sort of disappeared so um just like to see what the latest ideas are latest okay sorry Deepa, you keep moving um <clears throat> yes last time we spoke to members of city council specifically the ones who have historic districts will be affected by this um they were on board but it's been a while so once we get these back from the dnd we definitely have to meet up with city council again yeah. And just to bring them up to date on what these changes mean and how they're going to affect property owners. Okay. All right. But at the moment, no, I've not had contact with city council. Got it. Okay. Well, if you <clears throat> need any assistance with that, feel free to let me know and I'll, I'll Thank you. Can help you out. Thank you. Uh, yeah. No. And I mean, if any of the other commissioners want to help out, I mean, feel free, you know, just coordinate with Pro-V and we can try to get this going um, again because yeah it's been a long time it's been a year more or less since mm -hmm. the last time. so um okay great thank you um on to the next item so we have items 11 and 12 which are both presentations um just a quick check it's, it is almost it's, it's 7 6 p.m you know, i can get this one at another meeting would like DJ. Okay. All right. Yeah, Russ, if you don't mind, that would be fantastic. Um, thank you. Yeah, we can hold off the subcommittee discussion for the next HLC meeting. Um, in fact, I, I'll just make a quick vote on it. Actually, no, it's just a presentation discussion. There's no need for action. Okay. So. Yeah. Never mind. Um, we'll wait next time. So the only thing left is the. Um, Sorry, is the National Historic District proposal from the county? So, is county staff still on the line? I'm here. It's me, Valerie. All right. Sorry for the big wait. This is a big meeting. <laughs> Not a problem. Believe me, I completely understand. I greatly appreciate you allowing me to provide some information. And um, I did not see any of the attachments that I provided to Ms. Velasquez uploaded to the agenda. Um, Ms. Velasquez, do you want to show the presentation or is it okay for me to share my screen? You can go ahead and do that. Okay, so I am uh, requesting to, sh um, actually it says that you need to provide me with the uh, access to control. Are you able to see the presentation here? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. And I will be very brief because I know that you guys have been at this for going on over three hours here. Um, basically, we are at the phase of the project. I'm getting a message here, mm -hmm. but you are able to see my screen, correct? No. Not okay. anymore. Let me try again. Yeah, you just have to re-upload. Okay, how about now? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Great. Thank you. So we've been working on this project for quite some time. You may even remember uh, quite a few months ago my attending of your uh, meetings with regards to the Chapter 2020 amendment. Um, at this point, we have moved well into the project. Uh, we resumed the project earlier uh, last fall. Um, here before you are the boundaries as they were selected from the original survey. And on August 3rd, we received the first draft, which kicked in the 60-day review period in tandem with the Texas Historical Commission. I'm going to be sharing with you the link where you can find access to the full uh, narrative along with the comment matrix. And um, currently, as part of the review process, the, of course, the County Historical Commission has provided feedback and comments and edits. The Heritage Tourism Advisory Council has also participated in addition to members of the community and property owners and local historians. In November, 
the state, uh, the Texas Historical Commission will forward the draft over to you all for your review as required as a certified local government. Um, but in getting ahead, because it is a rather lengthy document at nearly 200 pages, we thought we would go ahead and provide this information ahead of time. Um, so as I mentioned, I'll go ahead and share the links with you on the chat. We've been compiling all this information and just uh, presented the feedback that was given by the, the community to the court as of earlier today which was accepted by the commissioner's court. And um, all of that feedback will be provided to Hardy, Heck and Moore as of Friday, October 2nd, which will kick in the second draft production, which is what you'll likely be view reviewing um, as of uh, the beginning of November. And all of this is in preparation for the January 2021, excuse that typo there, uh, but for the January 2021 State Board of Review hearing. In the meantime, the survey itself has been published already on the county website. Anybody is welcome to access it, um, particularly property owners who are interested in taking advantage of the local, state, and federal tax credits towards the cost of restoration of their buildings. Um, I'll be happy to share that link with you as well in case you want to share it with any property owners that you're familiar with who are looking to take advantage with these re of these resources. Um, as I mentioned, in November, you'll be receiving the draft for your own review. And um, in January, this is just a, a timeline. In January, as I just mentioned, we'll be taking the whole project to State Board of Review with hopes of submitting the final nomination package to the National Park Service uh, in February. And then, as in case there are any questions, um, you may recall from one of our last visits that the original boundary or survey boundary area was much larger than what I showed in the very first slide here. Um, so, Segundo Barrio, it was suggested by the Texas Historical Commission back in January that we split the district, which is why you don't see it in the current survey boundary uh, that was suggested for, for downtown. Um, so Segundo Barrio has now become its own project and we expect to receive that narrative draft sometime after Thanksgiving and that will also kick in the same 60-day review period from the Texas Historical Commission um, and also for the county to review. Um, again, in accordance with the certified local government policy, we'll be forwarding that draft to you as well for, for the city to review. And we anticipate taking this project uh, package to the State Board and during the May State Board of Review hearing with an anticipated submission to the National Park Service as of June. Um, that is all of my presentation. Um, I know in the past, DJ, we've talked quite a bit about putting together educational workshops and programming to spread the word about all of the uh, resources that we intend to share with the community. Uh, Ms. Velasquez has informed me that we are prohibited from doing that. Um, I, it is still my hope because of the, the ordinance and, and CLG status, but it is still my hope that the county and city can partner up on these efforts since they are important projects that impact both the city and, and, and the county. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to address them now. All right, thank you again, Valerie. Um, yeah, that was a good summary of everything that's going on. Um, for anybody who is not already aware, this is the result of three years worth of work. So it's incredibly, you know, exciting to see this this first draft nomination on the table, up ready for review. Um, so when it comes down to it, the big thing right now is to, um, sorry. Sorry about that. The uh, my dogs came into the uh, the room. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So yes, the next thing right now is to just see how we can help. Now, Provi, as you as Valerie said, the big thing is to um, yeah, the city and the county as of now cannot um, necessarily work together. Correct. Okay. Well, I can read to you uh, the portions of the code where that's addressed. 
Okay, so we looked at Chapter 2.24.020 duties, which are the duties of the Historic Landmark Commission. Okay. Okay, that states... Okay. The HLC shall thoroughly familiarize itself with buildings, interior structures, sites, districts, areas, and lands within the city that may be eligible for designation as historic landmarks. And number three is nominate landmarks, H overlay properties, and historic districts to the State Historic Preservation Officer for consideration to the National Register of Historic Places or to the Texas Antiquities Landmarks and to review and comment on any national register nomination submitted to the HLC upon request of the mayor and city council. So that's where that comes in. That's why this is strictly a discussion presentation, okay? So we can't really do anything until we get direction from the mayor and city council. We are also a certified local government, CLG, with the SHPO. And if the SHPO does ask us to comment on the nomination, then yes, we can do that as well. But as far as we can tell, these are the only two entities that can ask us to do that. Okay. All right, thank you, Kobe. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit unfortunate. Um, so that leaves us with some options. Um, now, Valerie, I do have a quick question. Has the County Historical Commission put together any sort of volunteer workforce to um, to organize this, to, to have people sign up and help with this stage of the process? It's in the works. So for the time being, we're working on putting together educational materials. Um, as you can imagine, with nearly a thousand buildings uh, between both proposed districts for downtown and Segundo Barrio, we have quite an undertaking ahead of us. And, and first of all, in notifying all the property owners of the proposed districts. And then um, it is still our plan to hold virtual uh, workshops um, to, to further uh, advance those efforts. HHM will be coming down in December to hold a public meeting, which everyone is invited to as well. And beyond that, though, we're also looking to put together, just as you mentioned, a uh, sort of volunteer workforce to assist property owners with the preparation of applications for, his, for state and federal historic tax credits. We know that that process can be daunting for some. And so we're going to be looking to our architectural preservation committee in particular to assist with that effort. And I'll be sure to to forward the information to Ms. Velasquez in hopes that she'll share it with you all as we go uh, moving forward. I understand that no comment can be given on any of these projects unless the state or the mayor requests, but that shouldn't impede our ability to collaborate on educational resources. Okay, thank you, Valerie. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Um, feel free to reach out to me at any time. I'm happy to, I'll post my contact information in the chat as well. Hopefully everybody is able to access the links that I just posted. And I, unless there's any further discussion or questions, um, I, again, thank you very much for your time this evening. Okay, thank you. And, uh, Take care. Yeah, thanks. Right. Um, any other questions, discussion points for this item? I guess the only thing I have to say real quick is, yeah, since the County Historical Commission is putting together, you know, some volunteers, I mean, all of us are entitled to join in those volunteer efforts. However, I mean, we do need to be mindful that if we are in a quorum anywhere we need to have that posted publicly so that's the only caveat that i can see um that could get in the way of volunteering all of us at once um now russ feel free to elaborate on that if i missed anything or said it incorrectly. Um, no I, I think you're correct there dj um you know whatever you all want to do outside of your official capacities yeah, yeah. okay all right, thanks, Russ. Yeah, so if anybody wants to volunteer, I mean, Valerie sent her, you know, she has her information on, on the chat. So um, I highly encourage everybody to, to do their part if they can. Um, but otherwise, we'll wait for the, the mayor or city council to, or the SHPO to come back with us for an official comment. Um, thank you again. This is a really great presentation. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. Take care, everyone. Have a good evening.
Right. Good night. Okay. So, Provi, last item. Um, new HLC meeting dates for the rest of the Yes. Week. Okay. So, um, as you've noticed, we canceled last week's meeting. What's happened is that City Council has adjusted its schedule. And I think that's to accommodate people who are at home during COVID, perhaps parents who have kids in school. So instead of starting meetings at 9.30, they're starting them at 3.30 in the afternoon. And the day before, there's always an agenda review to go over this. So when they're starting that at 3.30 in the afternoon on Monday, that cuts into our time. And we're basically told that we have to pick some new dates. So I was going over the city council schedule for 2020 and the HLC schedule for the rest of 2020. And we can sort of pick up where we left off. We cannot have a meeting next week because that's when city council meets. So the 28th is out. But we can have one October 5th, and that happens to fall in line with our HLC schedule until we get to December. In December, we had two dates planned, the 7th and the 21st. Uh, right now, it looks like we're going to have to scrap those and just have one meeting December on the 14th. But other than that, the rest, besides the 20th next week and December, the rest of the calendar just falls in line with what we had before. There really isn't, really isn't much of an adjustment. All right, well, that's not as serious as I thought it would be, so that's pretty good. Yeah, it turned out well. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for looking into that and um, informing us of everything. Um, I mean, my only request is, I mean, can you provide us with a, an updated schedule until the yep. end of the year? Okay, yes. so then we can just yes, absolutely. fix our calendars all at once. Um, yeah, because that'd be a huge help. Um, does anybody else have questions or anything regarding the new dates? All right, doesn't look like it. So, Proby, thanks again for looking into that. Um, since this is the end of the meeting, um, I'd just like to say thank you everyone for being online for over three and a half hours. This is the longest HLC meeting I've ever been on. So, um, Eddie, they're not usually this long. So, <laughs> no, they're not. Yeah, if you could if you could hold out with this, you'll you'll be set for the rest of your term. Yes. So, so thank you for your input, Eddie. Yes, yeah, that's really valuable, and I really am looking forward to hearing more of it in the next meetings. With that said, um, I don't want this to drag on any longer, so if there are no other comments or questions, I know my dog wants to leave, so um, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn today's meeting. Second. Okay, all those in favor? I say aye. Ivan, aye. Aye. Okay. Morris, aye. Okay. Shane, aye. Okay, great. I think uh, okay, perfect. And welcome, Eddie. Welcome again. Yes. Thank you, Ivan. Yeah, yes, welcome. welcome again. Yes, welcome. welcome Eddie. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned at 7.23 p.m. Thanks again. So we'll see you October 5th. Yes, October 5th. Thanks. Okay. Thank you all. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.